first NCAA tournament as a head coach in the first half. It was a big lead. And then St. Mary's just hit a bucket to tie the score. Um, your team is on offense. What are you thinking um, as they tie the score after a big lead? Well, the first thing I'm thinking, should I call timeout um, and kind of give them – NCAA tournament as a head coach a in the first to, half. To kind of – It was a big lead. Back in and, and then – Really be St. Mary's just hit a bucket again. to tie the score. Because um, we had the um, best Your team is on, on offense. And uh, Darren Brooks, you know, he was back-to-back -back player of the year in Missouri Valley. But I decided to let him play. And uh, fortunately for us, we ran some motion stuff and got some – and one of our other senior leaders got fouled shooting the three. So, uh, you know, at that point I felt good because, you know, a lot of people say, should you roll the dice in a clutch situation or if you have a veteran team, do you let your best players make the plays? And at, at that point, we felt we had the two best players on the court in Stetson Harrison and Darren Brooks, and I just let them play because they were seniors. And, and you know, we'd won, been through so many battles. Uh, Sweet 16 is freshman with those guys, and then my senior hit all three free throws. And then once that happened, I said, okay, now our defense can kind of get set, and now we can guard. And the very next play, we make them travel. So, again, it's, you know, it's one of those deals where when you're a young coach, you've always been told, call a timeout to regroup. But when you have an old team, I wanted to make sure, even in this big stage, and even though I coached them all year, that I was going to ride or die with the older guys uh, in what could be their very last game. Wow. That's, that's true. I noticed the play, the first play you went, you went to, it was to get the ball into the post, but it had another option for a three. And then kind of the same thing, you had the option to hit the pop, but you created a lane for a drive. Right. Right. And that those, you know, we just really were just running motion and then trying to space out and let our attack guys attack, whether it was ball screens or handoffs or just trying to make sure um, Darren Brooks got the ball at the end of the play, whether it be a ball screen or whether it be a play where he can go make a play. Big shot. So again, you know, it finds the senior's hand. Um, and, and, and we ran a quick hitter right away. Then we got into motion. Then we just ball screen, played, made sure those guys, we hit the dive guy on a pick and roll, swung it, then made an extra pass for a wide open three. And with the ball screen, I noticed that you guys got the ball out of his hands. Were he the best player? Or that just was the kind of this year that was the, the scheme for it? Well, we were a big time trapping ball screen teams. So any anybody who was in a ball screen, and no matter how good they were, we was going to trap them. And we just, you know, we their best player um, was player of the year in their league, and it's the guy right who got a foul, who we got a foul on. Um, he was held scoreless up until this point, and this is four thirty eight left in the game, and he hadn't scored a bucket. And, and that's what we did to people defensively. We 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 made you beat us with guys who don't normally win games for you. And I think that's something as a young coach, when you think about stuff, can the other dudes beat you um, if their best, if their go-to guy and their, and their crutch for the whole season is taken out of the, taken out of the grand scheme of things? That makes sense. That makes sense. And so in the motion, did you have, were your bigs capable of making threes or – well, more, one of them was our two bigs were freshmen <laughs> at this point on the court. So, oh, wow. you know, that, that's the beauty of And they became our great players. And when you was in the league, Alvin, those guys were the seniors. Yeah, I uh, definitely Matt remember. Matt Shaw, Randall Falker. So, <laughs> so, so they, those guys were freshmen <laughs> at the end of the game. And what they were doing then was being screeners, you know, get, making sure the best guys got open and got the ball. And, again, Darren Brooks is making all the plays. You know, he's getting the rebounds. We're running the stuff for him. Every time down now, everybody on our team knows. And Jamal Tatum ended up being the future star of our player. He's on the court as well. He ended up being player of the year as a senior. This, these, ball, these, 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 buck, these balls are going to Darren Brooks. And, again, making another play for him. He's back-to-back -back buckets. And you've got to go to your go-to guy when it's time to go. If, he, if you're going somewhere, he's going to take you. And, and we made them call timeout after it was just 47 up. And we could have called timeout, but I wanted them to have confidence in me that I believed in them. And so look at the run at this point. And that's where you – these are the type of things – these are why you remain close to your former players. Because in those times when you can make them feel like you believe in them more than anything, you make them think like they're supermen, 
they'll all they'll never ever forgive how you met, forget how you made them feel. And and Darren Brooks was already, you know, player of the year when I came back as an assistant. And for me to let, let for, for him to let me coach him and be player again, player year, player of the year in our league, offense and defensively again, was a, was was just a, a credit to him. Then we guard again. Um, so since they've tied it, so since they since they tied the game, they, they they've only scored two points. That's from the free throw line. We actually guarded them every possession. But now we're going again. We're going to go to Brooks again. We're going, to, we're going to make sure we go back to him. But now we do a handoff series with him. But he's just got to have the ball. And, and then we get into motion and get into ball screen actions. And then, oh, you know, we, we cut to another second. Come, come on. Here we go. Now we're back. Um, but, but the beauty of it is, is you being able to trust your guys. And there's a freshman, you know, Matt Shaw, who, you know, he's a Hall of Fame player. But you didn't know he was going to be this good. You knew he was going to be good. But you didn't know. But for me to have two freshmen out there at the end of the game and a sophomore and Jamal Tatum at the end of the game to decide whether or not the season keeps going or not is huge for their confidence. Again, great defense. Darren Brooks gets the rebound. And, and now we're just playing. Now they just go into that mode, the winning mode of what they really know how to do, close games. This was a great group of closing games. But as freshmen and sophomores – how did they earn your trust? Well, that's a freshman mistake right there. Matt Shaw's a freshman and just lost the ball in the backcourt. When we're really trying to milk the clock, I didn't yell at him. I just ignored him. You know, I really wanted to go crazy, but I turned my back and I ignored him because I knew if he caught eye contact, he would really be screwed up mentally, you know, about him making a mistake because then they just hit a big three. Yeah, you know, so now we got to call timeout to make sure that, these, that our freshman babies that are in, calm down. It's okay, guys. You know, it's okay you made a mistake. Don't compound it by not doing your job on the defensive end. And, and that's what kind of happened uh, on that, that very next play. So, again, we out of the timeout, if you can rewind that, Alvin, we, we ran a play called home run where we ran everybody up. They were, we knew they were going to come back and press us. And we, ran, we, ran, we threw home run uh, and get Jamal Tatum, our, our, mo our, our fastest guy with a wide open layup, um, we get a goaltending call, but we still get a basket. And it's just a it's a great – it's a very well-executed play by our guys to set up, you know, and now to actually execute it in the – we're not talking about at, a, at an exhibition game. We're talking about an NCAA tournament game where you your guys have to make these type of plays if you're going to go on past that first round. And that was a five-point game when you decided to do that. Right. It was it – was, it was, again, and that's – that's why those dudes, what are these young guys, that's what those dudes rock with me. Because I said, hey, guys, we're going to run home run. And it's a very, it's a highly dangerous play, but we ran it to perfection to get what we got out of it. Again, another great defensive play and another run out um, to go finish the game. I noticed, like, every play is like, a, it's a contested shot. Right, and that's what, you know, we want to – we're known for closing out. We're known for, for making you uncomfortable. But this group was really, really good at what we say. Um, when your guy catches it, make him protect the ball. Don't allow him to be aggressive. Make him protect the basketball and, and not, not – and take away from his aggression. You can't shoot it and you can't pass it if you're protecting the basketball. And that's something we really prided ourselves in. And then, you know, just taking charges. And, again, another great defensive play where we stop, you know, have a they, we make them handle the ball and, and really longer than they wanted. They wanted to score right away. Um, you know, we just need, we needed to finish the playoff by getting a rebound. Man, every shot is contested. Right, another block. Wide open. I thought he was open, then we block it. And that's how these guys were trained. They just really were bought in um, to really what, what I was selling to them and getting them to, to hey, man, no open shots, no matter, no layups, no open shots. Make these dudes pump fakes. Make these dudes go backwards before they go forward. And then this is just a – I remember this. That was a great defensive recession, but that was a great individual play. Yeah. Like, that was one of the few times that they made an offensive move one-on-one -on -one and scored on us in the game. That's a contested shot. You can live with that. You can live with that. You can shake his hand on that. You, he earned that. He earned it. So now they call timeout again to really try to figure out how they're going to play us. And we had to make sure 
we had two different press breakers, whether it was a zone press breaker or a man press break. We had to make sure they had both going in. And we made sure that Darren Brooks had a, had a count in his head. If he couldn't pass it in, we wouldn't call timeout. So we, so we made sure we, we, we had everything for, them, for our guys to have going back out after the timeout. Um, so number one thing, we said we want to keep it away from the sideline and get that ball in the middle and keep it in the middle as quickly as we could. And then they fouled us again to try to get the ball back. And then after that, it becomes kind of a free throw contest. It becomes a free throw contest. It becomes them trying to shoot it quick and us going to the line. And then you get your senior up there who actually got this whole thing thing started when he hit three free throws after being fouled from a tie ball game. And you go from 640, you know, our seniors have dominated the end of the game. And that's what you want. You want your older guys to dominate winning time. And the guys who know how to win should have the ball in those situations. You can, you can, out, you can out trick yourself as a coach saying, I'm going to use so-and-so as a decoy to get somebody an open shot. Well, no, you, you make sure those real dudes have the ball um, and make, make sure it's on them. And then if they fail, it's on you. If the best guy doesn't come through in the clutch, then you can take the blame for that. But when the best guy doesn't have touches down the stretch, you, people will be very critical of why didn't you get so-and-so the ball down the stretch. Why didn't he touch it here? Why did you not call timeout? And you notice all those plays, our guys, our best players are the ones deciding the game, making, making sure every shot goes through them. How old were you when um, this was your first year as a head coach? So how old this were is, you? This is my, I was 32. I was the youngest head coach in the NCAA tournament for three straight years in a row. And, um, you know, Fortunately, we had some great teams, and, and, and I coached in six NCAA tournament games, three and three in the NCAA tournament, and then uh, two and one in the NIT. So I've had a lot of postseason experience um, and, and just a lot of experience allowing your guys to make plays on the biggest stage because that's why they go to college, to play in the NCAA. It's not about the head coach stand. You know, sometimes people make it about, oh, that he's a great head coach, but people remember those players making those plays more than anything in those clutch situations. As a head coach, I just, as a young head coach, I just felt like I had to make sure it was about them and not about how young I was because that was the whole thing. They tried to make everything about how young I was. Could I handle this job? Could I, could I do as good a job as Bruce Weber and Matt Painter who were in the big 10, you know, what could you do? Can you top that? And, and that was kind of the things I was fighting as, as a young head coach was, are you going to let this thing go the other way? Well, we, we all know what you did. You did a tremendous job. And um, obviously, working with you, I learned a lot from you. And I know why your teams were successful. And um, I know, you know, at some point when you get your another, your another opportunity, you're going to do the same thing that you did at Southern Illinois, what, like we just watched. So. I appreciate you for sharing your knowledge to all of us. And it's not something that we only can learn from now, but we can learn from later when we go back and rewatch this. So thanks for sharing your NCAA experience. First year as a head coach, first year in the NCAA tournament as a head coach. And to be in crunch time situations like that and not call a timeout and trust your team is definitely something that I definitely learned and that's big time. No, thanks, Alvin. Hello, everybody. Dream Dowling, assistant men's basketball coach of Conference USA Champ, uh, University of North Texas. Welcome to today's episode of Be Ready Chalk Talk. My segment is going to be on the matchup zone. I'm a defensive minded coach, and uh, I like the matchup zone. I think it's a really, really good defense once you put a lot of uh, effort into it. But right. today, the matchup zone, I'm going to do a breakdown of just the defense is set up and what it looks like. So you have X1 will be at the top of your key. X2 will be at the high post area, choking the high post. X4 will be on the left side wing. X3 is on the right side wing. And X5, who is your mic man, will be your biggest post player uh, at the rim. And I call him your mic man because he's the guy that's going to have a lot of responsibility in telling the defense what's going on from 
a, a wing standpoint and from a post entry standpoint. Basic basic coverage of the the matchup zone is simple. Uh, everybody is high and wide. Okay, um, your X four guy, your X three guy, they need to be high and wide, straddling the three point line. Okay, so if the three point line was here, they sh these guys should be straddling the line right now, as you can see. Okay, X one should be right here at the top of the key guarding the basketball. So I like to break the court down in the thirds, okay? So you, you break them out down in the thirds. You got your outer third, your middle third, and your outer third again, okay? In this area right here, X1 or X2, depending on who is up, uh, defense will be at that time, they need to be pressuring the basketball in this area, okay? You need to be pressuring the basketball in this area. Going back to what I was saying about being high and wide, the reason why you want your guys to be high and wide, you want them to be there on the catch on any perimeter pass to the wings. Okay, you want them to be there on the catch. So if the ball is swing to this side, if it's swing to this side, X1 turns and straddles the three-point line right here. Okay, he turns and straddles the three-point line. X4 now takes the ball. X3 drops. He drops right there. X5 comes over. He's always low side, low side in case there's a drive baseline, okay? Low side or full front on the block. So X4 now takes it. X2 is now to the elbow area where he's protecting anything coming in there. He's always choking the high post, all right? Okay. In red right now, I have the offense which most teams go to, which is the 1-3-1 against the matchup zone. So, as you can see, X1 is guarding the, X1 is guarding the basketball. X3 and X4 are high and wide. X2 is choking the high post. When X2 is choking the high post, he's primarily standing like this with his hand in front, making it hard to just throw the ball directly in there. X5 is right here. He's communicating, letting everybody know what's going on. So most of the time, this is what happens, um, where guys are on offense, Okay, if the ball is passed, okay, to the right side, again, like I told you in the previous video, X1 turns and chokes the high post, okay? Now, when the ball is passed, most of the time guys cut through. And now, there's what we call two in the alley. So here's what happens. Now that the guy is passed and the ball is cut through, X1 turns Okay, because he's straddling the three-point line like this, and he turns and he goes and he bumps X3 down so he can cover the guy that just cut through. So now X1 is now guarding the basketball because he bumped the guy down. So here's what happens now. X2 now moves to the front side of uh, the guy in the high post. X5 is now low side or full front in case anything happens as far as guy driving baseline, okay? So the action took place to where there's an overload on the right side wing. We got two in the alley, okay? Mike Man is fronted. Uh, he's, he's low side in case the guy drives baseline. Offensive guy happens to drive baseline. Now X5 and X3 traps the basketball. X2 falls down to protect the middle air from anybody that might be cutting. X4, who naturally has a foot in the paint because of the ball movement, now he's the guy coming to help and be low side again if there's anybody in the painting area trying to get the basketball. Then once that happens and the trap happens, everybody usually throws the ball back out to the top of the key and then what you do right there is you reshape. When we get back into our tandem of X1 at the top or X2, it doesn't matter at that time. And then X2, X3 and X4 are now high and wide again. And the mic man is yelling, reshape, reshape, reshape. That way everybody knows to get back to the natural position. X1, uh, pressure in the basketball. X2, choke in the high post or vice versa. And then you have also X3 and X4 high and wide, straddling the three-point line. X5 is being the mic man, letting everybody know 
No, no overload in the alley. He's doing a lot of talking. So I know you're probably saying, what happens now if uh, a team goes to a two guard front? So it's simple. Two guard front, you match up. You're no longer in the tandem. X1 and X2 now straddling, not straddling the three point line, but heels on the three point line, pressure in the basketball. X4 and X3 are still high and wide, but they're underneath their guy. Anything that comes to the side, they're icing it on the side, sending them baseline, okay? Sending them baseline. So if the ball, the ball is on the side, again, X3 and X4 is sending them baseline. Any ball screen that happens, any ball screen that happens in the middle of the floor, okay? Any ball screen that happens in the middle of the floor, X1 and X2, switch it. They're switching, they're switching, they're being physical without fouling, and they're switching any ball screen that takes place, okay, with these two guys, okay? X5 is still being the mic man, he's talking, he's being loud, he's communicating, okay? So if there's a two guard front, you look like a high school hairy 2-3 zone, okay? Where you just match up, you come out of the tandem, and you match up, you match up, that's what you do, okay? Anybody in the high post area, Above uh, the charge circle, that's X5's guy, okay? Hi, how we doing today? How everybody doing today? Good, AB. Good. Good, brother. man. Good, brother. Good, brother. Good, brother. Good, brother. Good, A.B. It's good. All right, we go. Um, let me mute everybody real quick. You the real MVP. Nah, that's you. <laughs> We're already having technical difficulty around here. Can you mute everybody? All right, here we go. All right, first I want to um, thank everybody uh, for coming on and being on um, part 14 of Be Ready, which is crazy. Time is, time is flying by uh, for us to be on 14 already. But thank each and every one of you for being a part of it. Um, it's, it's been special as far as, I mean, we've, we've had people, we have guest speakers that, has, that have gotten promotions from Be Ready. We have participants that have became head coaches. Um, guys are killing the interviews and I can't take credit it's for it's from everybody in this room and it's from all the guest speakers that sharing their knowledge. And so um, something that um, was put on my mind um, like last week. So what we just watch, if any of you want to do a video, um, it could be at least you know, up to five minutes. If you want to do a video to show um, that you can coach and that you more than just a recruiter, or you more than just a video person, or you more than just the ops, then you're welcome to send me the video. And I'll, you know, I'll do my best to play everybody video before, but, um, you know, I think a lot of us get put in a box from whatever job title that we hold. So, and, you know, in order to get out of that box and it helps you practice teaching what you know, I think it'll help us go a long way. So um, I want to thank Coach Lowry for sharing his knowledge earlier today and Coach Jareem for sharing his knowledge um, about the matchup zone. Um, so moving forward, if you have a video, feel free to contact me. Um, I'm on Twitter, Instagram, if you don't have my number. Uh, case, um, you can, in case you don't have that, then you can email me at my Baylor email, whatever it may be. Um, so I'm excited about the two guests today. Um, we're going to first we'll have um, Coach Tavares Hardy. He's from he's, he's the head coach at Loyola University in Maryland. Um, it's a guy that, you know, obviously have been around a lot of great coaches and played at Northwestern. And so he's learned um, some really good stuff. So I'm excited to learn some, not only about his journey completely, but some X's and O's from them. So without further ado, Coach Tavares Hardy. What's up, everybody? <laughs> Thanks, AB, for the introduction. Um, first and foremost, just want to say this has been amazing. 
Um, just the fact that, you know, AB was able to put this together uh, and then being able to come on from time to time, haven't been able to make all of them, but been on a, a decent amount and just seeing all of you all, uh, the way you're interacting, um, the way guys are stepping up, using their voices, um, the eagerness to learn, the eagerness to grow, uh, all that stuff is just, it's what is what's going to make our game special. And uh, as we all strive to help these young men become what they want to be, I uh, just really want to say, you know, to AB and Coach Tang and everybody else, all the all the folks who put this together, this is big time and, and I enjoy it. <coughs> um, so thanks for, for you guys all listening and, and, and coming on. Uh, I want to take this a few different ways. Uh, I do want to cover my journey uh, just because I know there are a lot of us aspiring head coaches, uh, also folks who are aspiring to move up in the business. And, uh, you know, I'm just really proud of uh, the people I've been able to work for and the path I've been able to take. Um, and again, it's not, it's not like it's perfect. Uh, no one's is. Uh, we all have different challenges and we all have different, uh, different things put before us, but I'm really excited. And, and what I want to show is how, you know, the decisions I've made throughout the years have, uh, have sort of taken me to where I am. Um, and again, it's not, I don't think it's better or worse than anybody else, but uh, certainly my journey is important to, to, to where I am right now. Uh, and then the second part, um, you know, I want to make sure that I give you guys a little something X's and O's wise. Um, you know, AB and I talked and I know that, you know, there hasn't been a whole lot of X's and O's, although there's been a lot of great speakers. Um, and I've enjoyed you guys have, have gotten a chance to see, you know, the gamut a, ADs and head coaches from different levels and assistant coaches. And, you know, it's just it's, I just want to add my little input, uh, but, but show you sort of why I came up with my offensive philosophy. Um, and, and go from there. So a uh, little bit about my journey. So I grew up uh, outside Chicago, about 45 minutes uh, in Joliet, Illinois. You know, when I think about my basketball journey, it always starts, you know, obviously, you know, my mom and my siblings were important to me, but my basketball journey really started uh, when I was in high school. Um, you know, I, I think I had the setup, uh, the setup that, that I believe in, in terms of a high school coach that was good, uh, he was tough. Uh, he taught us how to play. He taught us offense. He worked on our skills, uh, taught us how to play defense, you know, like demanded from us. Um, you know, we didn't have a whole lot of talent. It was a good school, played in Chicago Catholic League. Uh, but it wasn't like what I felt when I went AAU ball, went to AAU. And I see my man Nick Irvin on it. Shout out to Nick. <laughs> uh, so up, I would say that combination uh, for me, the experience with a good high school coach, and then moving on to AAU ball, where to be honest with you all, when I first went out there, I wasn't good enough. Uh, my mom made me go play uh, in Chicago with the with the Illinois Warriors. Uh, I could barely walk and chew gum. I was about six six, a buck seventy. I uh, went to that first workout, and like I was embarrassed. Everybody was dunking, like five eight dudes. Uh, you know, everybody was just better than me. Uh, and I walked out of there, and it was a challenge for me to to tell my mom. But I was like, look, you know. They're a little better than me. I don't know if I should do this. And she was straight up with me like, you know, you, you're not there yet, but you're going to get there. And I would say for me, uh, her, her telling me that and me sticking with it sort of changed my life. And so I was able to play AAU ball on a team where I didn't even play that much and then go back to my high school squad. And uh, I was a lot better. And then I did that and repeated that a few years. And then all of a sudden now I'm a division one recruit, uh, getting a full ride scholarship to, to, to Northwestern University in the Big Ten. And, uh, you know, I say that that piece, that sort of, I got the toughness part playing on the AAU side with, with guys. Uh, and I was able to take it back and have a great coach at the high school level uh, to help me develop. That, that combination is what I believe in. I believe in that model. And so shout out to all the AAU and high school coaches that are doing big things for their student athletes. As I said, went on to Northwestern. I was recruited by Kevin O'Neill. Uh, one of the big takeaways for me uh, in college, I had a chance to play for two different head coaches. Uh, and Kevin O'Neill was a, a defensive minded, a uh, little bit crazy, but uh, just an incredible basketball mind when it came to defense and, and was an unbelievable recruiter. Uh, was super aggressive, was one of those write a thousand letters to a recruit to make sure he knew you love them type of guys. Uh, was able to start as a freshman, which was important to me. Uh, started every game on a good team, ended up going to the postseason. Uh, two years later, uh, Kevin O'Neill leaves to go to the New York Knicks and Bill Carmody comes in, uh, who was the head coach at Princeton. So 
for those of you who know, those are two completely different uh, styles of coaches. Carmody came in, we didn't work on defense at all. Uh, we are very offensive minded. Uh, he's super creative uh, in, in what he does. And, uh, you know, again, just sort of having those two made me a better player, made me a better coach. Uh, after that, uh, after playing, so I finished my career, had a good career. Um, you know, I wasn't an NBA guy, I knew that. I uh, made sure that I had good internships in the city of Chicago because uh, I knew that NBA basketball wasn't in my future. But uh, I certainly wanted to play basketball for money and, uh, and keep it going. So ended up going overseas, uh, played a year in Finland. It was a decent experience. Uh, came back. Actually, and this is where my story probably takes a little bit of a turn for most of you. I'd say for a lot of you, it's probably been similar so far. Uh, but this is where it takes a little bit of a turn. Uh, I came back from playing overseas and I actually wanted nothing to do with sports. Uh, basketball had defined me for so long. Uh, you know, everybody was telling me that Northwestern was such a great academic school and I experienced it, but I wanted to see what that meant. And so I took a summer internship uh, with a private equity firm and, you know, just wanted to get my feet in the door and, and, and see what this business world was really all about. Uh, so in the process of that, uh, got offered a job at JP Morgan, which is one of the top investment banks. Um, and it's just, it, 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 that's the path I decided to go down um, and, and became a banker. I went through a two year rotation program, which may sound a little, little lightweight, but it was challenging. Uh, we got some bread, but they put us through the grinder. Uh, but it was a great experience. I felt like I got an MBA in two years going through what we went through. Uh, out of that program I was the first person promoted to a banker role. Uh, our program was more back office, but one of the managing directors uh, liked my personality and, and knew that I was more of a client guy. So he put me on a, a client facing side and uh, I did that for a year. At the same time that I'm coaching, I'm sorry, at the same time that I'm working at the bank, uh, got offered a job to uh, help out an AAU team. It's funny how small world this is. Uh, Brian Wardle, who was uh, also on my AAU squad, head coach at Bradley now, uh, he was uh, coaching an AAU program and decided to leave and go take a director of ops job at Marquette. Uh, so when he left, uh, the guy who was running the program asked me if I would take on his role, uh, take on Brian Wardle's role. So I stepped into that and was doing it uh, just for fun. I, wanted, I had no desire to be a college coach or anything like that. Uh, just did it for fun. And uh, you know, if I didn't do that, I certainly wouldn't be here. Uh, so three years coaching AAU, three years working for a bank. Uh, went to one of my mentors, Craig Robinson, who you guys might know is Michelle Obama's brother. I go to Craig, he was assistant coach at Northwestern. I say, Craig, I wanna do a little something different with my business. I think I'm, I might leave JP Morgan and go to Merrill Lynch. And Craig says to me, well, you know, I watched you coach your AAU squad in Vegas. I, <laughs> I had a bunch of suburban boys and we went out to Vegas and we won a Nike main event. Uh, you know, I don't know how we did it, but we went 7-0. We beat, beat your boys, Houston Hoops. We beat Albany City Rocks. Uh, we won the tournament. And so Craig tells me uh, that, you know, I, I saw you coaching your squad. I think you might be a good college coach. And I said, Craig, to be honest with you, like, I'm making too much money. <laughs> and I was just being real with him. I was like, I can't afford, you know, my lifestyle if I jump down to be a college coach. He asked me to come to Brown with him. He felt like he was about to get the head job. And uh, you know, I told him, I, I was actually joking. I said, look, I can't go to Brown with you, but if Carmody want to talk to me about taking your spot, I would consider that. And I literally was playing around. I, I didn't think it would happen. And uh, a few weeks later, Craig called me and said, yo, coach want to talk to you about what you said. Um, I will go back in the story a little bit as I was coaching and as I was working at the bank, uh, I also was on the booster board for Northwestern. And so I was around the program, uh, gave my little money, uh, was helping to make decisions on certain things. So I was around, but never did I think I would be coaching uh, at Northwestern. Um, so, you know, that was my first job, got the opportunity, uh, was coaching there for seven years. We went on a nice run uh, for the, the best uh, years in school history. Um, left there, uh, went to Georgetown under coach John Thompson III. Uh, was there for three years, got a chance to get to the NSA tournament. Um, and then left there and went to Georgia Tech with coach Josh Pastner. Um, and so that's sort of my, my coaching journey. Um, obviously, you guys are gonna have some questions in terms of you know, those transitions and whatnot. I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time. I mean, I'll answer any questions you guys have, but obviously there's deeper things in those stories. 
Um, what I will tell you is there's a couple things I've done in terms of uh, some mock interviews and some anatomy of coaching changes where I've answered a lot of questions. So I wanna make sure we, we have time to get to everything tonight. Uh, so I'm not gonna say it myself, but if there's any questions you guys have, you can either ask me directly, email me, call me, or uh, check out those links if you just, I hate to say this, it sounds cocky and I'm not trying to be uh, cocky by any means, but if you Google me, uh, there's a couple links. Uh, both of them are with Daniel Parker, who uh, we all know is one of the top search guys in our business. Um, one time I did a mock interview with him that I think for some of you guys would be very useful. Um, and then uh, another time we did sort of the anatomy of the coaching search with my AD and Daniel Parker that, that showed how it all went down and uh, how I got to this position. So I'll, I'll take a moment of air and uh, turn to AB. Anybody, anybody got questions on anything, any, any part of that journey? Um, if, if you have a question, um, please say your name, what school that you're from. Um, that way, and just, we are on YouTube live. So if you ask a question, just know that it's gonna be in the public. And also um, everyone, please turn your cameras on. We like to really interact and really get to know one another and be ready. So please turn your cameras on. Coach Hardy, I have a question. My name is Will Weaver and I coach with the Sydney Kings. I'm curious to know what impact working in that private equity world and that banking world had on the way you approach decision-making, if there's things that you draw a straight through line from watching those people uh, go about making really hard, complicated decisions and the way you recruit, the way you hire, the way you game plan. Absolutely, that's a great question. First of all, Coach, I'm looking forward to hearing you, uh, hearing you later on as well, uh, spit some knowledge so I can get some, get some plays. Uh, but no, the, the journey I've been on, it's so interconnected and I've been able to use each aspect of it to help me uh, be better in, as I continue to grow in, in, in each and every other aspect. And so definitely working in the business world, first and foremost, like, you know, it was hard. Uh, and I know sometimes I feel like my story may turn some coaches off because to be honest, I didn't have to go through the graduate assistant route or the GA or the director of ops. And I, 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 I don't knock that at all. I mean, I love, I, I got folks, I've worked with folks. Uh, and so sometimes I get a little, a little cautious telling that part, but our grind was the same. It just was, was a little different in terms of we were getting paid for it. Uh, but we were working till midnight. We were working till 2 a.m. My managing director was cussing me out anytime, you know, I give him a, a file and, uh, you know, the, the decimal is off, you know, or, or the fraction or whatever it may be. Uh, so I had to go through it just in a different circumstances, but certainly learning from those folks. That program I was in, again, not to sound cocky, but it was, it was JP Morgan is one of the few companies that survived that initial financial crisis. And uh, we reported, our program reported right to the team manager. And so Jamie Diamond, who's the, head, the CEO of JP Morgan, you know, the way he manages his business. Morning. Okay, hold on. Uh, Todd, I think that's you. <laughs> uh, the way he manages his business, um, you know, it, 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 it really is a shape a lot of what I do as a head coach off of that, uh, you know, the attention to detail, the structures, I'm gonna go into it in a little bit, a little bit of, of, of sort of our program philosophy and all that ties into the things I learned in the business world and how they manage, how they manage the Fortune 500 company. Looks like no more questions, your world. All right, I'll press on. So those, uh, so I get this, this job, right? So after being an assistant coach, associate head coach for a long time, um, you know, I, I, I sort of positioned myself uh, to, to become a head coach. I was starting to get some interest. I've had a few, a few interviews and, uh, you know, now we're going into Loyola's open. Uh, and this is a job that I want. This is a job that I feel I'd be perfect for. And so for me, right off the bat, I wanted to make sure that I was prepared for the job. Uh, and I talk about that a lot in those, in those mock interviews. Um, and then, so I get the job. Once I get it, 
how do I showcase that I'm really ready? Uh, and then for me, it was about sticking to the plan. And so I came up with a lot of strategies. I came up with a lot of details in terms of what I was going to do and how I was going to do it. But the main part, uh, you know, when I got the job and what I've talked to my coaches a lot about is, you know, that wasn't fluff. It wasn't just interview material. Uh, we got to stick to it. And so uh, I knew what Loyola was all about. I knew what they were looking for. And now how can we stick to the plan and execute all those great things that I said we can do? Now, you know, I want to be straight up and clear, like, you know, we're, we're a work in progress. Um, we just completed our second year. Uh, first year was, you know, good. You know, no offense to anybody. You know, everybody knows we didn't inherit much. Uh, but, you know, <laughs> funny story, I talked to my guys uh, and I, I try to get them to talk and I say, you know, tell me a little bit about, you know, what this team can do. And uh, their response was uh, in our first meeting, we, we can't shoot very well. Uh, we're not very good passers and we don't see the game. <laughs> and so when I heard that, I, I knew we had, uh, we had our work cut out for us, but I tell you what they were. Uh, and I got to know this throughout the year. Uh, you know, they were a resilient bunch. And they battled and they fought and they improved. Uh, and that's what our first year was all about. We were picked to finish last in the conference. Uh, we ended up finishing tied for seventh. Uh, you know, and so that was, that was a good first year. We go into the second year. Um, we've done what we've, what we've been asked to do. Uh, we recruited at a really high level. Um, we, signed, we signed some good guys that we thought would be able to come in and help us. Uh, we, 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 expectations were raised a little bit. Uh, and so we go into to year two feeling pretty good and we get off to a great start. Now, one of our freshmen uh, who was a big recruit for us from Spain, uh, he, he has surgery before the school year starts. And so he's out, um, you know, for, for the foreseeable future. But the guys were able to hold it down without him. Uh, we were nine and five in non-conference. I like to judge it. I say we were we were nine and five, but four of those games we got bought. Uh, so we were really nine and, or I'm sorry, eight and five. So we were eight and one against teams our size, uh, which I felt pretty good about. Got smacked with the injury bug. It happens. Uh, uh, you know, it happened to us in a way that I can't imagine. Three, three of our top players went out all around the same time, uh, but we were able to fight back and, and finish off with a good year. Year two was, uh, was better than year one. Um, so just gave you that little background, but what I really want to do is sort of talk to you guys and show you the things that we put together and how I tied all that in once I got the job to being, being who we are. Can you guys see my screen now? Yeah, we can see it. Yes. All right, so for me, as I go into our journey as Lo at Loyola, sort of what helped me, when I say I knew what Loyola was, so much of our culture is built off of the Loyola strategic plan. And so I really dug into the information uh, and got to know, okay, forget about me and where I've come from, but what is Loyola, uh, you know, and, and how can I shape and build our program to what Loyola, Loyola already is. And so a big part of the Loyola brand is a compass. And they talk about the journey. They talk about how an explorer identifies a goal, how he uses other people to collaborate and support. Um, and that compass guides them. The compass can show them the way. And so we've sort of taken on that compass as our symbol uh, to embrace the, our journey. We use the compass as our symbol and our guys really get behind it. And what I said in my press conference, what excites me most about Loyola University is the opportunity to fully integrate the core principles of the Ignatian way into building a highly successful men's basketball program. To me, that wasn't coach speak. That wasn't, I already had the job. And so I wanted to make sure I was able to utilize this message and really come through with it. And so I know you guys have been working on vision boards. I know you guys have been talking a lot about sort of what you want uh, your journey to be all about. And so for us here at Loyola, our mission to inspire and empower our student athletes to be great. And so we use the phrase Loyola great. Uh, we wanna be great in everything we do. 
Um, and our vision, the way we want to execute it, is to pro provide an unparalleled student athlete experience. So our focus is locked in on the student athlete experience. You know, that's what we spend our time thinking about as coaches. That we, that's what we spend time talking about with our administration. We want to make sure that the student athlete experience is at, at an all time high. The goal is not only will the guys go, go to war with us and go to battle with us um, and run through a wall for us, but they'll also understand that our model, um, you know, albeit unique or not, uh, is going to is going to help them in life. And so hopefully in today's world where there's a lot of transfers and things like that, uh, you know, they can see that this is the best spot for them regardless. And I'll, I'll be uh, uh, happy to say in my two years, we haven't had anyone leave our program, uh, which is not common. And so the four pillars that I talked about, so for on our compass, these are the directions, athletic success and all the things that come with that, that's important. So we put our efforts and energy into that. Uh, academic success, our team has over a 3.0 GPA for the first time in years. Um, you know, we've been really pushing them to be great in the classroom. Their impact on the community, Lord knows these major cities uh, need help. And, 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 you know, there's a lot of great young talented people out here that needs to be shown away. And so we put a lot of emphasis on, on doing our part to show the young men from underprivileged environments that they can be successful too. Um, and then beyond that, um, you know, our, our, our loyal community extends to the students, the, the, the faculty, the alums. We want to make sure we're impacting them in a positive way as well. And then we really push our guys to be leaders. Uh, you know, a quick story, one of our seniors, uh, Kavon Scott, he was a great, uh, a, a great kid, good academic kid. Uh, you don't see this too often. He was, he was sort of hesitant about, you know, participating on campus. And so I convinced him to join the Student Athlete Advisory Committee, our SAT group. And uh, to his credit, he later became the president. Uh, and so I'm watching the Patriot League, uh, you know, their Twitter account, and I see you know, all the SAC leaders from a, from a conference they went to. And we got the only men's basketball representative, probably the only basketball representative and uh, the only, only black person on the whole committee. So I was really proud of that. That's something that we take very seriously. So these are sort of our core values uh, that we talk about every day. We grind, we're responsible, we're enthusiastic in everything we do. We're appreciative, tenacious. Tenacious is the one that we take the most serious. That's like being resilient, um, we want our guys to really attack those. These are our non-negotiables. Uh, these are the things that as coaches and players, you gotta have, and you know, we inherit certain guys, but we push them to it. But from a recruiting standpoint and from a hiring standpoint, for me, you gotta have these four qualities. And then for our, for our coaches, as we evaluate ourselves, I know Jason Belzer, I know he was on, uh, who's my agent, and he talked about our, uh, our balanced scorecard. This is how we evaluate ourselves. This is the thing, these are the things we think about as coaches. So any questions on all that right now? I know that was a lot. Hey coach, uh, Paul Langenfeld, Waco Midway. Could you go back to that great acronym? Yeah. What was the, uh, the A on that one? It was appreciative. Appreciative, okay, thank you. Tavares, yep. quick question for you about uh, how were you able to maneuver into a situation where you were able to do those mock interviews? Obviously, that's a great um, opportunity to be seen and exposed, but also to build a relationship with the search firms, which is a tricky thing. So can you kind of talk to us about how that came about? Absolutely. Uh, and so, you know, I know there's been some conversation on here about agents uh, and should you have one, do you need one? Um, what I'll say is Jason, who's been on here a couple of times is great. And I know for a fact, I would not be here without him. Uh, and mainly not so much that he got me the job and uh, Jason may be on here or he may be watching uh, and, and he'll be the first to tell you, like he didn't have, he had, he didn't really have anything to do with in terms of getting me the job. Uh, but what he did was he helped me prepare to get the job. Uh, and someone talked about earlier uh, on one of, the, one of the sessions about your agent markets you. Uh, and so Jason, you know, number one, he felt confident that 
if he offered me to do something, uh, you know, I would do a good job. And again, uh, that's the most important thing, even as you're trying to progress through your careers is do a good job at your, at your current job and make sure people know you, they respect you, uh, they trust that you'll do the right things. And so uh, Jason had the opportunity to, to do a mock interview. He was talking to Daniel Parker and, uh, you know, I was the person they came up with. <laughs> uh, I wasn't one of those guys, um, you know, and I, I don't knock it at all. I didn't, I never got invited to the Villa Seven. Uh, you know, I did some of the, the other stuff. I did like, you know, NCAA had the champion form, NCAA had the ACE program, you know, I did both of those programs, but I wasn't, I know some people talked about uh, hitting up ABs and, and meetings and all that type of stuff. I never did that, um, but I knew some search guys. Um, you know, I was able to establish a relationship with one in Chicago uh, just off of just being a, a normal person and we got to know each other. Uh, and so when Jason presented my, my name to, to Daniel, Daniel knew who I was from, you know, those champion forums and other things. And, and he was like, yeah, that'd be good. Uh, and so to be honest, I, I didn't know what to expect uh, watching that. Uh, I would do some things differently, uh, but it was raw. We did it in one take. I felt like Jigga. Uh, we didn't, we didn't have to stop and re-record and, 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 and go back and correct. Like that was 17 minutes and it was all, it was all real. And I stuttered. I mean, I'm stuttering now. Like, you know what I mean? I, I made mistakes. There were things I wish I would have answered differently. Um, but, but it was me. And I would say a lot of those questions, even though I elaborated on them, uh, definitely showed up in my interview process. Thank you. Tavares, uh, Amir Abdurrahim, Kennesaw State. So I, I got two part question for you. One, you, you talked about what you inherited, right? And, and you said it wasn't much. Um, my, my first question is, what did you what did you do going into year two um, to, to really like grow the program and make sure you didn't take a step back? And then uh, the second part of that question was how many guys did, how many new guys did you bring in uh, or recruit going into year two? Yeah, uh, thanks Amir, that's a great question. Uh, I would say, you know, one of the things I didn't do was tell them I didn't inherit much. <laughs> uh, I said that here, but that's something I don't talk about. Um, you know, I, I, we all as coaches, and, I, and I've been through some coaching changes, both as a player and as an assistant coach. And so it's important to make sure that when you get these jobs, your guys feel the love. Um, and and, I, and I, having went through what they went through, uh, that, that was a big uh, uh, important part. So I actually apologize to them for saying I didn't inherit much because I inherited a good group of guys. Um, you know, I, I made sure that they were just as much a part of what we were doing as anybody we recruited. Uh, I wanted them to feel it. I wanted them to, to know it and understand it. And we were fairly young year one. Um, and so a lot of our guys that we had to go through the, the ringer with that first year were coming back the next year. Um, and so that really helped in our transition. We had a kid, our leading scorer, uh, led the Patriot League in scoring two years in a row. He only averaged 10 points a game the year before. Um, you know, he, he got better and he worked and he believed in what we were doing. So he was able to help, help with our transition. I'll also say I've been able to, ha I've been able to hire great assistant coaches. Um, you know, the two guys I got now, uh, I'm sorry, the three guys I got now, they're phenomenal. Um, and from a recruiting standpoint, uh, we've done a, a couple of unique things. I, I hired an a international coach. There's probably a handful of them in the country. Uh, and, and he's been incredible, um, Ivo Simovich. And, and it's funny because when I hired him, uh, we met in San Antonio at the Final Four uh, a day after I got the job. And I didn't know him, but we got, I got hit up by a bunch of different people um, telling me about how great he is. And he got hit up by a bunch of people telling me that, that he should talk to me. And we met and like the synergy was unbelievable. Uh, and, and I, he didn't mention recruiting. He didn't mention, I got some players. He didn't mention any of that. Uh, I hired him and, and I wanted him a part of my staff because he was a phenomenal talker about the game. He had passion about player development, which is a part of our student athlete experience. And I got a little lucky because he did come with some bazookas in his pocket. Uh, in terms of recruiting. We had three of our freshmen this year were on the all league team. <laughs> um, two of them were from Spain. Uh, and, and so, you know, that, that, that's, that's why we're so excited about what we got going forward. I hope that answered your question. I may, I may have went off on a tangent, but um, you know, I think that uh, that's why we're so excited about where we are and where we got going, what we got going forward. That was, that was perfect. Thanks.
Luke Demond, Adam Hood, uh, UTSA. What's up, Tavares? How you doing, man? What's up, Adam? Hey, uh, I just had a quick, quick, uh, quick question. What what made Loyola Maryland the job that you went after? Like you mean, you said it was perfect for me, and I'm like, okay, is is was that regionally? Was that your background? Was it Patriot League? What what made it the perfect job for you? You know, it's funny. Uh, you all and you know us all who are young head coaches, like you're always. It's always hard to navigate your path, right? You want to make sure that you're doing the right things. You want to make sure that you're not self-promoting. You're not, you know, thinking about the next job. You know, I love the the folks who have talked about plant where you grow. Um, you know, has been mentioned a few times. Um, grow where you plant. I mean, uh, it's been mentioned a few times through some of these clinics, uh, some of these talks. And and I would say for me, as I was growing where I was planted, I also was realistic um, in terms of what the future may hold. And so, you know, when there is those opportunities to think about jobs, you know, I watch a lot of hoops. I watch a lot of basketball. And so I, I study leagues and, and things where, you know, I might be a good fit. If you look at the places I've been, so I was undergrad at Northwestern, I coached at Northwestern, I coached at Georgetown, coached at Georgia Tech. There's a lot of commonalities between those places and Loyola. Uh, you know, all places, strong emphasis on academics. Uh, you know, they're all in major cities. Um, you know, Georgetown even, I, I would say, uh, I probably wouldn't be the head coach at Loyola if I never went to go work at Georgetown uh, because it's Jesuit. And people have no idea, like there's 28 Jesuit schools, like they stick together. Look at most recently, the, the head coach of Loyola Marymount just got the job. Uh, Stan, where did he come from? Marquette, Jesuit. Uh, the head coach at Holy Cross, Holy Cross is Jesuit. Where did he come from? Marquette, Jesuit. <laughs> uh, and and there's, there's more. Um, there's more of those out there. And so I didn't plan that. That wasn't part of my path, uh, but certainly it helped me get the job. But my path was to sort of make sure that everybody understood that my background, uh, being in those academic environments, uh, being in those major cities was something that I, I not only uh, did, but I loved it. I, I view it as a competitive advantage, and I sold that during my interview. Thanks. Coach. Yes, sir. Coach Dwayne Joshua, NASA Pride ABA. How you doing? Doing well. How about yourself? Good, man. Good, man. Thanks for having me. Uh, so I remember in the early in the, the conversation, you say you started the uh, AAU route. You know, I did yeah. about eight years in the AAU game that I did for the high school, and now I'm coaching uh, ABA professionally. Uh, question I have for you. Now, what's the, the biggest adjustment you had to make personally, you know, as far as going from the AAU level to the college level with yourself? And, um, you know, just, can you talk a little about how you, you know, pursue that job or where you at as far as Loyal Marymount? You probably took already, but you yeah. for me a little bit. Yeah, and so, you know, Again, that's where it was a little unique um, in that it wasn't, the reason it wasn't a typical path and the reason I felt so comfortable going right into the Big Ten as an assistant coach was because I had been recruiting for Northwestern my whole collegiate career. And so, you know, telling the Northwestern story for me, uh, based on my personality, based on the fact that I grew up right around there, um, you know, it was, it was something that I was already ready for. The other part, and this is where I know a lot of folks have talked about not letting people put you in a bubble. Uh, you know, my, my head coach, Bill Carmody, who I, I, I adore for him giving me this opportunity and I've learned so much for, from him. You know, he said flat out, look, I want you to learn offense, defense. I want you to, uh, you know, do scouts, do scheduling, like do all this stuff, but I need help. I'm, I, I hate recruiting. This is what he told me. It's like, I can't, I don't like, talking to 18 year old kids, like that's not my thing. And he was like, so while I'm not labeling you as a recruiter for right now, go recruit. <laughs> and so like, that's what I had to do. And it was able to, I mean, he was on the chopping block. We had, we ended up getting good players and, and having a nice run with the four straight postseasons. And there was only three postseasons in the previous history of the school. Uh, and we went to four straight. So we were in a good spot, but like, you know, one thing along those ways. So those first two years, I was just recruiting. And then as we went into years three and beyond, and he named me associate head coach. And like, he just really sort of started handing me responsibility. And uh, as I, I grew within that program. But what I'll say is this, like, you know, coming out, when I got my first job, I hired an AAU coach. 
I didn't hire him to get me players. Uh, and I told him that same thing I said to Coach Evo about the, the internationals. Uh, I was very clear uh, that I wasn't hiring him to get players. He was coming from takeover. Everybody assumes you, you get the takeover coach, you don't get takeover players. I, I wanted him to help me sort of mitigate and navigate some relationships. Uh, but I, I liked the way he coached. I watched him closely at the Peach Jam. Uh, I watched him closely the way he interacted. And so for me, that's how I am. That's how I go about my business. I'm watching, um, you know, I'm watching guys on this, this, this chat, to be honest. Um, not today, because I'm talking so much, but uh, I've, been, I've been on a few times and you know, I, I am, call it what it is, in a hiring position. And so I, I watch. Um, and, and before I do something, before I hire somebody, you know, I make sure I get enough information and, 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 and then make that decision. That's awesome. Thank you, Coach. Hey, Coach, this is um, Brandon Branch from Memphis Day Academy. Um, so with your core values um, and the campus you were saying when you entered the interview, did you have all of them goals and core values going into the interview? Or was that something you made up with your staff? You came, you created with the staff and afterwards? No, I, I had most of them lined up. Um, and, and I did give a portfolio. I know that question has come up uh, in the past, but it was after the interview. Um, and so I went in. I did a deep dive uh, prior to on how I want to want to run a program. And I knew the type of programs I would go after. And I knew that they would all fit that. Now, what I will say is in terms of understanding the Ignatian compass and what it meant to be a Jesuit, um, you know, I had to do my homework on that. Uh, and then once I got that down and, and saw that so many of the principles, I mean, I, I know Mike Boyden said a few weeks ago, he's a nerd. I mean, I'm a nerd, uh, you know, I, I really do believe so many of those core values fit into the way I want to play. Uh, and so a lot of, you know, what I talked about is how I can merge all that together. And our style of play is going to be very similar to a lot of the Ignatian principles, um, you know, caring about someone other than yourself and sharing the game and uh, being versatile, like all those things are, are, are in the university mission statement. And that's the, that's the way I want to coach. That's the way I want to play offensively and defensively. Thanks, Coach. Tavares, Lonnie Griffin here from Northwood University. Um, I know, and it, it's going to piggyback off the, the core values question here a little bit. At what point did you feel like your core values, where you were driving it, when it became more of your assistants and your players driving that, that core, those core values? At what point, or have you reached that point yet? Uh, we're, we're still, we're still, uh, I'd say we're closer. Uh, we've been, we've been having uh, some very, very powerful and productive Zoom talks. I want to thank AB for showing me that breakout function because um, it's, it's been good to get our guys talking and communicating. Um, but, you know, we're still a work in progress. Like I said, I know right now sitting here talking to you guys, I sound like I think I know everything. I know I don't. Um, you know, I know I'm a long way away. Our journey is, 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 is just beginning. Um, and there's so much to learn. I'm a, I'm a learner. Uh, you know, I'm a studier. But at the same time, like, like you said, you, need, you can't do it by yourself. Uh, and, and, you know, I'm constantly pushing sort of big picture uh, to our staff and, and to our players. Um, and, and I know, you know, we'll start experiencing more success as they have. Uh, and they continue to, to, to spit it out more from, from themselves. And so that's something we're working on. We're a work in progress, but uh, the guys believe. One other unique thing we, we do, uh, being at a Catholic school, uh, we do a retreat every year. And uh, you know the guys speak on our core values at our retreat. Um, and, and so that stuff has been good for us. That, that stuff to me is not fake. Uh, all the stuff you say to get a job, like I said, you know, I made sure that we we lived up to those in terms of uh, continuing to speak on it and, and learning and growing from it. Coach, how you doing? Coach, how you doing? Brandon Cosby, Miami Dade College. What's up, man? Not much, not much. Um, question, being that you worked at a lot of academic institutions, um, what, is, what, is, what is the sacrifice, let's say, between a good academic student versus taking maybe not as high academic and, and taking more of a athlete versus, you know, the higher academic, what is the kind of trade-off and 
you know, how much are you willing to bend on that, you know, working at those type of universities? Yeah, yeah, and so what I'll say, you know, I know we're on YouTube live, so I, I, I say, you know, the, the academic stance, first of all, Patriot League, we have an AI, um, an right. academic index that uh, people have to meet. If you don't meet that, we can't take you. Uh, if you don't have a certain combination of GPA and uh, a test score, um, right. you know, if you don't hit that metric, we can't do anything about it. Uh, but what I've always said is, I, I look at myself, I, I, I didn't know what Northwestern was uh, when, I, <laughs> when I went there. Uh, my sister convinced me to go, she was at Purdue, and uh, she said, you, you want to play right away. You got a better chance of playing at Northwestern. And so I, I went there because Big Ten, I can play right away. And then I learned what the academics was about. Uh, when I got there, they showed me. Um, and and I, I learned that it can be life changing for people like me who didn't grow up with much. Uh, and, and so I've always said in every place I've been, you know, if I can give those opportunities to other people who just flat out weren't exposed, uh, but are capable, then I certainly want to do that. Uh, I never want to limit someone just because they don't have the same resources or their moms weren't lawyers and doctors and were told to be students their whole life. Uh, now they can't go to my school. As long as they can do the work and, and we can get them in, I've always believed that we can, we can take them and, and help mold them. Now, from a basketball standpoint, I, I personally don't believe there's a correlation. Um, you know, I know in some cases, if somebody's just straight up lazy, they're probably going to be lazy on the court. They might be lazy in the classroom. But, you know, for the most part, I feel like you know, I, I'll recruit anybody, any style of person. It's our job as coaches to try to, uh, to try to mold them and manage them. As long as they care about the things that are important to us, uh, we can make it work. Correct. Thank you. That was kind of what, what I was hitting at. I appreciate the answer. Thank you. Hey, Tavares, this is Jerome Tang. Is, do y'all have a, an individual academic in, index or is it a team academic index? The academic index is league-based, but each institution manages the way – they want to manage it. And so, uh, you know, ours may not be as strenuous as, you know, another team in the league, but they're all very close and they're all more strenuous than just make, just qualifying for the NCAA, uh, much more strenuous than that. They're not Ivy League, um, but that's, that's kind of what it's mirrored off of. Coach, Troy Pierce from SIUE, uh, Sister Men's Basketball Coach. I'm kind of piggybacking off of uh, Coach Amir um, on the opposite end of the spectrum. So you say you guys finished year two, and obviously um, the situation that we're in, it makes things a little more difficult, but what are some of the things that you're focusing on going into year three? Um, what, what are some of the values or some of those things that you're expressing to your guys or some of the things that you want to do as a staff that you're focusing on? Yeah, I mean, I think number one for us is <laughs> we want to be, we want to be healthy uh, mentally and physically. Uh, we, we took a, we, we got beat up a little bit last year through no fault of our own. Like I said, one guy came in, hurt, um, played in a, a European under 18 and got a little banged up over there. And so he missed uh, 20 plus games. Like, uh, and, and so that hurt. And then one of our other freshmen who was balling uh, got hurt at the beginning of the conference play. Uh, we were sitting at nine and five with them. We lost our next eight games without him. Uh, he's a freshman. Uh, and, and so like, it was just a challenge dealing with that. So we want to make sure we, we keep those guys healthy. When we had our whole roster, it was only six games with our, with our three best players. And, and we went five and one at the, in the heart in February. Um, then another, our best player got hurt again and missed the last three games. And we, we limped through the finish line. But for us, that's <laughs> making sure their bodies and minds are healthy is, is, is number one. But, uh, you know, then, you know, for year three, we want to step up in terms of transparency and accountability. Um, you wanna make sure they know exactly what's coming um, and then hold them accountable. Um, you know, the, the, the sort of honeymoon period is over. Um, and, and so like turnovers matter, uh, you know what I mean? Springing back on defense and executing those things like to the, to the level we need them to let, win, uh, to the level we need them to to win a championship, that matters. And so we're gonna be really, uh, really hard in terms of holding them accountable and the attention to detail. Hey, hey, Tavares, Lance Irvin, Chicago State University. What up, Lance? <laughs> that happened. Speaking about injuries, that stuff that happened, and I was bit with the injury bug. I think I maybe played, I think I maybe had like three guys play the whole year. During the season, after guys got hurt, was it anything? Did you cut practice down? Did you have to change your style of play? What are some things that you did to help you out during those situations, during those times? 
Yeah, no, it was a, it was a challenge, and I'm um, I'm going through my deep dive now in terms of things I wish I did differently. I, I was never worried about practice and or practicing them too much. Um, you know, the, the injuries were freaked <laughs> and, and beyond our control. Um, obviously, as the season goes on, you naturally cut practice. Um, but for me, it was more about you know I think I I, I gotta I gotta go back and look, but. You know, out of those eight games we lost when we were down, we were down our two best players. And in a couple of those games, we were down all three. Uh, you know, we still could have won. We had leads in the second half in three of them. And you win those three games, you, you feel much better about yourself going into the year. You finish the season, second year with a winning record, uh, winning conference record. And so what I'm looking at is I, I can point to probably one of seven things in each of those games uh, that I could have controlled and did differently, and we would have probably won the game. And so, you know, I'm just trying to analyze myself. I, my staff think I'm crazy sometimes. Like, I'm really hard on, on myself, but, but more so, it's another Jesuit principle. It's more of a reflection. Uh, and so, like, I never point fingers to my guys. I always look to what could I do? What, what could I have done to help them out? And uh, to be straight up, Lance, you know this, like, there's probably times, I would say, in two of those games, I can say in a huddle, I got on a guy trying to hold him accountable. And his face went went there and he was bad the rest of the game. That's probably why we lost. So, you know, he's got to either build a culture strong enough to where you don't have to worry about that stuff. But in year two, it's hard to say that you have that. And so you got to make adjustments and, and be ready to do what it takes to win those games. Hey, Coach Hardy, how you doing? Andy Schmidt, North Texas. What's up, Andy? Hey, man, um, kind of going off the last two questions, you know, I've got your Ken Palm pulled up and – you know, I, I kind of not knowing anything about your team assumed you had some injuries, you know, during what looks like to be a rough month of January. But, man, kudos to you to get turned around in February. Can you kind of talk about, you know, and you kind of have been the, the, you know, intangibles or kind of what you did to stay afloat, you know, with your guys, what you did to kind of keep it positive, keep it loose um, and, and still growing and still learning, having a, you know, a, a commendable season at the end of the day. So kind of talk about you know, what you did to fight that injury bug or, or things you've learned um, just from this year? Yeah, it, it was a challenge. <laughs> um, you know, again, not blaming anybody, but we were playing guys that hadn't hadn't played that much before. And it was enough to get us leads in the second half down the stretch. But was it enough to, you know, not call switch and then not switch and give up a three that up two, <laughs> which happened in the game, like literally two guards who played a lot, but, but didn't play in those crucial one didn't play in those crucial minutes. You know, we're up two points on the road and he calls switch and then don't switch. <laughs> uh, yeah. And so being able to uh, being able to, to fight through those circumstances uh, and then learn and grow from them. Uh, you know, those kids, they, they want to win too. Um, obviously they didn't want to, not switch uh, things happen in the heat of the moment. So Brian Wardle uh, actually called me during this, during that stretch, uh, the head coach at Bradley, who I referenced earlier. Um, and, and, you know, he just was saying like, you know, it's, it's hard in year two to have your culture in place to be able to withstand those type of injuries. And, and, you know, we didn't, but I tell my staff all the time, you know, that, that can't fly in year three, we got to be able to withstand it. If knock on wood, it happens again. Appreciate it. Coach. Uh... Lester Stewart, Casper College. Uh, two questions, actually. My first question is, uh, you, were, you said a lot about player development. So my question is, how do you, what do you emphasize in player development? More of your system or more just getting the players individually better? Yeah. And also, what do you feel is your best skill and how does it help your team as far as you coaching them? Yeah, and, and so, two-part question, but I tell you, grow, uh, not growing up, but growing up in the game, I'd say probably what, if, if I have to say there's three things that assistant coaches, you know, need to be responsible for, we all know player development, game preparation and recruiting. And so if I had to judge myself, I'd say player development was probably where I put the least amount of my in, in, uh, energy individually, if that makes sense. I mean, I, I've, I've worked with guys and gotten guys better. Uh, but I've always worked with assistant coaches, fellow assistant coaches who sort of have been big time at that. And so, you know, I'm not one to try to, you know, I need to be able all involved. Like I let those guys do their thing. I watch um, and learn, but knowing that that wasn't something that, you know, personally I had 
all the time been in the trenches on terms of player development, I knew that I needed to attack that with my staff. Um, and, and so with my staff, you know, I was able to, I, I have three guys right now uh, that are big time in terms of player development. That's, that's their thing, all three of them. Um, you know, I talked about Ivo Simovic. Uh, Ivo has worked with the Spurs. He was a head coach in Spain for years. Um, and he does a great job just getting guys better. Uh, Freddie Owens, um, who played, we played against each other uh, when we were in college. He played at Wisconsin. Um, you know, he, he's a long time coach, coach just as long as I have. And his passion, uh, you know, when, when, when he was available and I was able to hire him, uh, he was working for Bill Carmody, my former coach. And that was the first thing out of his mouth. Like he gets guys better. Uh, and then I, I got a Taj Finger who played at Stanford, um, spent the last few years working with Oklahoma City, uh, was with the Big Thunder doing stuff on the court with Steven Adams and those guys. And then last year was, uh, was in the G League uh, as an assistant coach. And he worked with us at Georgia Tech. And so, you know, he's 6'9". He's phenomenal with my bigs. Uh, and so, like, player development, to me, having those assistant coaches locked in, but it's also at the top of our program priority, that's what you want. Uh, and, and that's where, uh, you know, I, 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 to answer your other question, and I want to say this the right way, like, I'm not I – believe, I believe everything's important, right? I believe – you know, I tell this to my staff all the time. I want you, I want them working on just being a better ball player, dribble, pass, shoot, you know, break out the cones, break out the, all those gadgets and stuff. I personally never use them. So I don't even know how they work. I got to get on YouTube to figure out, you know, cone drills and jumping over boxes and uh, all that type of stuff to get a shot off. Uh, so, so part one is, is that stuff is important. And I do believe it is. And I know it is. But part two is also, okay, how do you, impl- how do you implement that into your game? Uh, development. And so, you know, the, combining those two parts is important to me. So we do a lot of shots out of the offense. We do a lot of uh, development out of what we do. Um, and, and so, you know, I want, I want to push them to that. Uh, and, and then I want them to utilize their skill set uh, with the gadgets and hopefully the combination will help our guys get better. And they have, our guys have improved in uh, dramatic ways, um, you know, year one to year two, and, and they continue to. Hey, Coach, Mandy Carver, Fresno State Women's Basketball. Um, You talked about not having any transfers the last two years and with the one-time transfer exception about to go through, any tips you can share on how you've retained them? I mean, again, who knows what's going to happen in the future in terms of us as well as everybody else. Um, But I try not to worry about it. Uh, I lock in on uh, the student athlete experience. And so... What does that entail? Am, am I delivering, are we as a program delivering on the things that we promised them when we're sitting in their living rooms? Um, I also, the way I've always recruited, um, and it's been different, uh, different levels, guys we can get involved with at Northwestern at the time were different than guys we got involved with at Georgetown. Um, but, and, and I don't like to talk about it, but guys I sort of individually led the recruiting on, or recruitment on, um, you know, we've gotten those guys, whether it was an under the radar kid or whether it was a top 30 kid, uh, we got them because of their parents. And I have continued that. Uh, so the way we recruit as a staff, um, you know, if your parents aren't involved, and again, that's taken, we have relationships with coaches. Uh, number one, you know, I, I like hanging out with coaches. Like I, I got some boys, uh, but we also want to make sure they don't, they don't kill us in the process. Uh, and so they know what we're about. But if your parents aren't involved, I haven't had much success recruiting that way. Uh, and, and so the things that I say to the guys and I make sure we deliver on, that's what really have kept people um, wanting to be a part of our program. And I don't do that by myself. My, my staff, sorry, I think I started with some of y'all with that. Uh, my, st- my, staff, uh, my staff is equally um, invested and powerful in that regard. Okay, we'll have one Coach. last question. If you have one last question. Yeah, coach. Yep. Dwayne Joshua here again. Um, so one of the things that you said uh, earlier, you said uh, your team went uh, nine and five, I think your first year, uh, initially jumping out of the gate. Nine and uh, four, yeah, nine conference, right? And uh, four of those games you said was like pay games. And, um, you know, particularly I can remember in college, you know, when we played those pay games for North Carolina and t man, I always felt like my, my coach, he, he kind of coached differently. The rotations were different. Uh, players were playing different minutes. I hope this, this question don't really get you in trouble, man. But is it no, something no. That, 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 that you coach differently when you're playing these pay games? I understand that you guys are getting paid from these other schools to come to the, 
the locations and whatnot, but do you guys, do you coach differently? Well, first off, you you know, man, nothing's better than taking somebody's money. <laughs> uh, so if you can walk out with a dub on top of, uh, you know, doing what's necessary at our level in terms of meeting your budget needs, um, you know, that's always the plan. I'll say this, uh, you know, we we play, you know, there's there's different levels to it. Um, you know, when you're when you're thinking about it in terms of, uh, you know, beginning of the season or later on, you know, year one versus year two versus year three, uh, you attack all those things differently. We don't prepare different. Um, you know, I, I would say I probably am a little uh, less, I'd say, I, I don't I don't because I don't I won't say I coach different, but like. I'm certainly not going to cuss a guy out if he gets his shot blocked by a seven foot pro. <laughs> uh, you know, it's just, you know, you just, you know, better. Um, you don't want to lose their confidence, but uh, you know, I'd say those games are, are different. We, two of them this year, we felt like we should have won. Uh, one of them, uh, you know, we had the lead, we lost by four and one of our freshman bigs, uh, got into a mental funk with his free throws. I can't remember exactly what he finished, but they went into hack-a-shack on him to win the game. Uh, and, and so, you know, that's something he's addressing in the offseason, so that never happens again. He's trying to get me to schedule him again. <laughs> and so our guys are hungry. Uh, we, we don't think about that stuff when we're recruiting. We, 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 we think we can beat anybody. Um, and, and so, you know, that's, that, that's how we attack it. We don't, we don't think of it differently. Um, but, you know, saying to you guys, four of those games were money games. You know, it's probably a little bit of a, 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 a fake moxie from my standpoint, to be honest. Like, in the, in the heat of those games, you know, I don't care if you're paying us or not, you feel it. Gotcha. Thanks, Coach. Yeah, he was two for 13. Just, just <laughs> your big play. We lost by four, two for 13. That's a little rough, but he's going to be a great player for us, so. Yeah, growing pains. That's that's part of the game. Yeah, yeah. Um, Coach Tavares, I want to man thank you for taking the time to help us. Um, I know, especially as being a head coach, is something that a lot of us aspire. And just hearing your stories and hearing your journey, and just you know, like he said, watching your team go from January to February, and you keeping their spirits up through injuries, like that's something definitely for all of us to learn instead of you know, being tough on them and, and making them go even down. So I uh, appreciate you sharing that. No problem. Thank you. Thanks for having me. All right. One of um, the next guests we have is Coach Will Weaver. Um, he's the head coach of the Sydney Kings in the NBL. Um, he's actually um, a guy that I used to ride with every day and actually drive every day when we were both assistant coaches at Sam Houston. So looking forward to hearing um, his journey and um, he's going to share some X's and O's. He actually is an assistant with the Australia Olympic team also. So he's going to share some X's and O's with us from um, Sydney Kings and Australia Olympic team. Without further ado, Coach Will Weaver. AB is great. First of all, I'm super humbled to be included in this. Uh, I've been able to attend a few of them, so I appreciate you putting it together. And Coach Hardy, that was fantastic. I learned a lot and took a bunch of notes. Um, I think the, the uniqueness of your journey is mirrored in all of our experiences. And I think the one consistent theme in anybody's path is that you're crazy thinking you're going to copy somebody else's path in this business as random as it is. Um, but the times I had working with uh, AB at Sam Houston and even just looking at the participants in here, there's so many people. Yeah, I'm from Austin, Texas originally and I'm a long way from home, but uh, there's so many folks that I worked alongside, even players I got to be on coaching staffs with and people that helped me when I was involved in recruiting. Thankfully, I didn't have to be that involved in recruiting because AB was such a monster that, you know, he took most of the most of the work. Um, and the rest of us uh, tried to figure out how to, you know, coach those players that he got us into not acting so crazy all the damn time. But we, the, the job I have now is um, appreciably different than the job I had then. I'll say though that the, uh, AB, can you change my screen sharing so I can put this PowerPoint thing up? The, the things that I learned sitting next to 
particularly coaches early in their head coaching journey really helped me a ton. And um, in particular, their willingness to uh, change and their willingness to maybe come in excited about one thing, but change to something else is super inspiring to me. So the flexibility shown by Coach Hardy um, and being open to coming into a challenge um, with a, a mindset about how it can help you um, is something that I've taken a lot from and see a lot of value in. So currently, like AB said, I work in Australia for the head coach of the Sydney Kings, and I'm an assistant coach with the Australian national team. Uh, most recently, I was able to coach the qualification window for the FIBA Asia Cup. So sort of like Coach Van Gundy did with Team USA, I look after those teams um, in the Asia zone. And uh, I was fortunate enough to work a number of years with the Brooklyn Nets and the Philadelphia 76ers coaching my first, uh, well, really it's my second head coaching experience because I did coach the freshman team at St. Andrew's Episcopal School, which uh, I probably where you guys all recognize me from, um, all the, the experience and accolades we got, I think winning about three games over the course of that season back in uh, when I was a college student at the University of Texas. But um, the Long Island experience was fantastic for me to get to coach G League guys and take some of my experiences coaching in college and bring that into a pro idiom um, as well as now taking the experience in that environment and taking it with me here to Sydney. So, um, like I said, the, the journey is everything and it's, it's what, how it frames the way you think about all these kinds of challenges. But, um, when I asked AB, what would be most interesting to you guys in this sort of format, he said, X's and O's, man, go straight to X's. Everybody wants to steal some plays or get some new ideas or challenge their own thinking. So that's what I'll do. Um, I'll dive into it and, AB, maybe if somebody has a question or something and you want to stop me midway through, I'll count on AB to just tell me to shut up. I'm happy to make this a conversation. Um, and if it's slow, we'll, um, that's okay. We'll, we'll cover stuff that's interesting, interesting to you guys. That's most important to me. So with our teams, uh, and I think this is probably the case with everybody, uh, rare is the time that you're not going to run when you're down big, you know, after a miss or a turnover, um, and I think increasingly people are recognizing getting more possessions in the game when it's your bonus benefits your offense. Uh, on the flip side, you know, most folks aren't going to run when you're up big after a dead ball or when the other team is in the bonus. Um, in thinking about how to present to you guys, I tried to sort of pick the two ends of the spectrum. So I've been uh, fortunate in some ways and forced in some other ways to play fast these past two seasons. We were number one in pace. Uh, in Long Island and we were number two in pace this season but really after we added a player sort of halfway through the year the back half of the year we were far and away the fastest team in the league far from a, a perfect way to measure speed offensive speed but a decent proxy that reflects how quickly we were playing after makes uh, and essentially where we landed was um, with certain lineups in the game we were trying to push tempo at every single opportunity so I think this middle column for all of us is kind of who, what your team is, you know, it kind of defines your offense. So you tend to pick something that you think is your best expected value of scoring points. Um, and you may or may not have different schemes based on who's in the game at any given time. But for our group, we tried to communicate it as just red, yellow, and green. And when we were in green, that was, you know, the, maybe Indy for some other, you know, the way NBA team might talk about it, talking about the Indianapolis 500, like get anybody, get it out of the net, flip that thing ahead, prioritize kick aheads. But for us, we identify the importance of also um, kind of using the mental trigger of green equals great. Like we weren't taking okay shots in transition. At least that was the plan. Uh, as you look, at our offensive efficiency, you'd probably find some holes in that theory, uh, both in Long Island and in Sydney. But as I'll discuss later, I think some of that's a natural symptom of playing fast. I also think that the more you play fast, the more comfortable your guys get, the stricter you can be with the decision-making that goes on at speed and the better job you can do of it relevant uh, relative to your opponents. So the three kind of paradigms we had for running were on the far left, you know, that to me is the after misses and turnovers kind of environment. And I was really inspired back when I worked at the University of Texas. We 
scrimmaged Davidson um, every year. And this was before Steph was Steph, but he was on that team and I didn't think he was gonna be that good. And so that shows you what, what I know, but there was a point guard on their team named Jason Richards, um, who was a beast. And the way they ran was he was getting the ball every time and he was getting to the middle of the floor and they ran shooters to the corner. And that's certainly, uh, Mr. Curry could do that pretty well along with some other guys they have. And it was just impossible for us to deal with. It just felt after makes, after misses, they were so comfortable in that environment that um, I have always felt like that is the most difficult thing to deal with teams that play in the middle of the floor, play with speed every, you know, consistently and like great football teams, right? Those receivers, you know, the quarterbacks, can, they can make those throws. Um, those receivers run those routes hard every time. The guys that don't pass the ball ahead and don't look to uh, reward guys who run, suddenly they start to shortcut their routes. And um, as you might imagine, trying to come up with non-American focused uh, metaphors here in Australia has been its own challenge, but um, I, the, the lesson is the same. And so finding guys that will pass it ahead and for our team specifically, being fortunate enough to feel like our guys all have the ability to take several dribbles and be that point guard now take some of the pressure off just one or two guys from being that kick ahead guy and allows you to sort of apply the golden rules like well you want them to throw it to you you got to do a little bit more of that too rather than um, just looking to drive in there like a bull in a china stop all the time so the what we did here mirrors some of the things we did in Brooklyn. Um, but like I said, it was inspired in part by Davidson and part of the time I spent in Philadelphia with Mike D'Antoni when, when he was an assistant coach on our staff. And I think there's so many ways to skin a cat, but his belief was always, we're trying to go to the paint. We're trying to go there, stay the hell out of the way, like give the player with the ball space to drive in there, create opportunities to cut there. And I think in transition, I've been moved to feel like that is uh, a winning philosophy more often than it's not. Picks and hooks would just be sort of early on balls. And this could be done with a great deal of speed or it could be done slower. But I think there's a reason why NBA teams run so many early pick and roll is because it's very difficult to deal with. Um, this would be a situation, at least in this last year, where we were trying to find our best pick and roll player with an outlet. Um, and if it was after a make, we would put a little higher priority on getting perfect spacing, but we didn't care whether it was one, one guard uh, in each corner or if there was a guard stacked up in the corner or the wing. What we cared about was that the bigs worked to try to get great angles on their screens. And oftentimes that meant running underneath the defender to get flat. Uh, one thing I stole from Kenny Atkinson in terms of verbiage was hit the bottom and roll. It works against almost every coverage and uh, when teams really drop, which is our primary defensive coverage this past year, it still allows you to get into drive and kick, which I believe is the hardest thing to guard uh, in any situation, but especially when you're fast. We'll take a look at that. And then the last section over here on the right is what we called corners, which was um, the way for us to really push tempo. So this was when we wanted to run, we would be in corners on makes and we would be an attack break on misses and turnovers. And essentially, the two highest players never looked back for the ball. They just sprinted their ass off up the floor. And until they got across half court, they weren't thinking about being involved in the play at all. The two low players that didn't inbound the ball would be trying to get high and wide and be outlets um, for the guy who scooped it out of the net, who was trying to get it as quick out of his hands as he possibly could. Again, dominating that middle of the floor was good for us. And then something I came into the year feeling like uh, having studied this league a little bit in my role as an assistant coach with the national team, there wasn't much small, small pick and roll. And I was lucky enough to coach several big guys who had the versatility to handle in pick and roll. Jay Sean Tate and Xavier Cooks played for us this year, if you're familiar from their careers with uh, Ohio State University and Winthrop. But um, when those guys were on the floor together, particularly when we were small, this allowed us to put a lot of pace in the game as you'll see in these coming clips and gave us the opportunity to now use guys like Casper Ware and Kevin Lish and Brad Newley as screeners, um, which if the defense is already cross-matched uh, because of the speed we were pushing it up the floor, we felt like it gave us a better chance to 
make them uh, create a breakdown in, in their scheme. So whether they were, were switching or hedging, I think oftentimes a weakness in an opponent's defensive scouts is, okay, yeah, we're switching one through four. Well, is it based on who you are or who you're guarding? So if it's based on who you are, there might be times that you lose track of a great shooter like Casper um, because you're used to guarding uh, someone that you aren't switching with normally. So that was our philosophy. Um, I was committed to doing that before the season started based on our personnel. And I heard Steve Clifford talk at a clinic about how every off season they made an effort to take the hardest half court action they dealt with during the season and try to steal that for their transition offense, which I thought was a particularly brilliant sort of way to think about things. You know, anything fast is hard to, to guard. Um, I think a big focus defensively. I've been fortunate that both the teams I've had have had very um, a high percentage of defensive minded guys, guys that see the game through a defensive lens and getting the game slowed down is key to, to being a good defensive team, in my opinion. Um, there are teams who can do it fast, but it's a hell of a lot easier to cope with stuff when you've got the ability to fill up the floor with teammates and keep the ball on one side, establish help, create pressure. So um, we hope that all of our philosophies kind of fit hand in glove with what we're trying to do offensively. Um, we're trying to keep other people from doing offensively. So corners for us is where we landed in terms of how to create a lot of pace in the game. Here are some examples of what that looked like for us. I'll touch briefly on attack break. Uh, you can Coach see Weaver. this clip here on the right. Yep. Quick question, I'm sorry, before you get Sure, not that. at all, come on. So if you can pull back up the last diagram yes, you just had. So I'm looking at this and a couple of questions I have for you are, it looks like you're five. First of all, you never put any pressure on the rim with your five. No one's ever running directly to the rim to post up. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, and the second thing is, there's not a designated person taking the ball out of bounds. It looks like the one's taking the ball out of bounds in corners and the four is taking the ball out of bounds and picks and hooks and they're outletting to a four in corners. Is that, is that correct as well? It is. So I'll give you a little uh, reason why. When I came into the year, this is, uh, I think, the danger of having a bunch of preconceived notions about players you haven't coached before and groups you haven't coached before. So obviously there's a lot of learning for me coming into this league. But um, as I alluded to earlier, I've been really inspired at, by at Texas. Rick Barnes changed the way he coached offensively from the year before I got there to the, my first year, which was the year we had KD and DJ and Damian and Justin and um, the great Craig Winder, who's, uh, who's in this group. So the speed which that group played was totally different than what had been very successful with LaMarcus and Brad and uh, Daniel and all those guys before. Jason Hooten dreamed of playing a certain offensive philosophy his whole assistant coaching career. We worked on it all preseason. That shit looked terrible in the scrimmages we did. And he had the bravery to change to what he thought would fit the group better. Um, when I came into the season, I thought that Andrew Bogut was going to be a huge piece of our offense and he was going to really limit the speed that we could play with um, because he's not the fleetest of foot kind of guy. Um, but what I found was that our one through four, we were um, very good in a fast game and our shooting wasn't as good as I hoped it would be. And um, the depth that we added by adding in Xavier Cooks halfway through the year took us from a relatively shallow team into a team where I thought we could really wear people down. So what that meant was I thought we were only going to run after misses to start the year. And I was like, hey, we're going to play in the playoffs. It's going to slow down and we're going to be walk it up and execute, which is a little bit of the second half of my presentation, talking about how we were gonna use Bogut at the elbow and let, the, let him make the decisions when it was crunch time, um, to very clearly what we became best at was um, more random pick and roll, more drive and kick, more uh, inter interchangeable parts where bigs could handle, guards could screen, vice versa. So. Corners is something we came up with halfway through the year that we felt like fit our group uh, when we wanted to run better than using sort of these attack break rules that worked fine after misses and turnovers, but didn't have the same kind of randomness and didn't put the same kind of pressure on teams as allowing anybody to inbound, um, allowing anybody to fill any different spot. Okay, so it's not necessarily the one taking the ball out of corners. No, it's sir. just the first person that can get the ball taking the ball out of bounds. That's it. 
I, I thought to start the year I was strict and I was hollering and stamping my foot saying, Biggs, you take it out. And uh, that's just going to slow you down if you really feel like you, you want to run. And so um, feeling that and feeling that our team wanted to run and I was holding them back made me make that adjustment midway through the year. And our guys, um, our guys really responded to it and it helped us uh, get to the finals. Good question. Go get a question. Yes, sir. Mr. Rencher. Coach Weaver, how you doing, man? I'm um, great. It's always a privilege to talk to the leading scorer in the history of the University of Texas. Well, we keep that secret for now, man. Uh, <laughs> but but real quick, Will, I mean, it's, I think it's extremely intriguing, man. And I, this is not even a, really a question. Um, you, you you have an intriguing story because you're one of few guys who have NCAA experience, NCAA experience, NBA experience, and international experience. Could you just speak on how that all of that's helped you? Do you still piece it all together? Are you more focused on an international philosophy? Do you, are you more NBA guy? Like how, how, how have you found yourself within all of those entities? Yeah, the truth is, is, you know, I still think I'm a, we all have imposter syndrome to some degree. I still feel like I'm a small private school coach um, that is, had no idea this world existed really until I was a, started to work in camps and be exposed to the kind of guys that um, really taught me about how much there is to learn about the game and just how much heart this path, this career path has. Um, the, I think one of the defining moments for me, quite honestly, was seeing when I was a graduate assistant at Texas, the off season and the way our gym filled up with players that were back from overseas um, guys that I had never heard of before, but that were so clearly ass kickers, you know, just really, really good players. And more importantly, knew the game so well through all their experiences and had such a wide range of experiences to pull from. That was a total paradigm shift for me to understand, again, to have my horizons expanded and um, understand how much I had to learn from them. You know, clearly there were things to learn from our current players at Texas too, uh, far more than they learned from me. But I think that was such a shift for me to understand just how much good basketball is played around the world. And um, it was something that drew my attention and made it something that I began to, once I had my eyes open to it, I spent a lot of effort trying to learn more about it and study um, what I might be missing out on and what American basketball might be missing out on by uh, being, you know, having sort of the exceptionalist worldview that uh, unfortunately our country is the sort of perfect emblem for these days. So I, I took a very different view of how much there is to learn from high school coaches, from AAU programs, from international teams, from FIBA teams, from small college from um i was watching florida state's defense yesterday and i'm like you just never get you can never get um i think mean, coach hardy hit on it like you, you never get tricked into thinking that you know one one thousandth of what there is to know um and on the other hand like you know there's a there's so many ways to be successful being yourself and trusting that um the sort of fundamental things that lead to winning in terms of who you're working with on a day-to-day -day basis and uh, understanding sort of the fundamentals of the game, the principles of the game that Coach Iva and um, Coach Wooden and, uh, you know, so many great coaches have used over the years. I, I, I just, um, those are the kinds of things that I believe at my core and that sort of inspire me to continue to study and, and participate in things like this. Coach, I want to piggyback on that. Justin Crow, Louisiana. Hello, Lyman. Mr. Crow. Man, you look familiar, man. Uh, I wanted to ask you, what, what was your favorite time period? What is what is your, your your favorite job, having been a lot of different places? Coach Wrench just mentioned it. College, you know, G League, NBA, and now obviously really, really high level overseas. What was your favorite time frame and, and, and why? I think each year has such a special you know, the, the seasonal, the cyclical aspect of our jobs is so powerful and, and I think keeps, you know, keeps you young, um, a fact belied by the 
salt and pepper nature of my gnarly ISO beard I got rocking right now. But um, I appreciate so many people showing showing their support with their their own gnarly versions um, across the country. I I think in terms of what's interesting maybe to this group, the I was blown away with how dumb I felt walking into an NBA coaching staff. And um, that was a great feeling, you know, that was to sit around guys that had made basketball and coaching basketball, their sole focus for so many years. Um, the number of games, I think is a super underrated aspect of the NBA, 82, you know, plus preseason plus playoffs, you get so many repetitions and are exposed to so many other brilliant basketball people. Um, you learn so much trying to game plan for guys that can't be game planned for. So I, I think my, my early experiences in Philadelphia, particularly being on a team that was so outmatched uh, talent wise was such a, a helpful environment. And I'll connect that to the fact that our front office and our ownership was unique. So um, our owners were, all worked in a variety of private equity and banking environments. And they had hired a, a general manager in Sam Hinkie, um, who in turn hired some folks that were non-traditional from an NBA decision-making standpoint. And I just loved the diversity of experience in our group. And I loved uh, going to work every day, knowing how much there was to learn from my colleagues um, and getting comfortable with the idea that, all right, we're preaching process and preaching that we're going to take care of the things we can control. And I loved seeing guys struggle with the reality of what losing feels like as many times as we lost over those first three years. And the test it was for all of us, but me in the beginning of my, of my professional coaching journey to um, cope with that. And I, I can't think of a better uh, baptism for coaching in professional environments than uh, having to really walk the walk about showing up to work every day and saying, yep, we lost, good, what's next? Like, what do we learn? What can we do now? So that surely wasn't the most enjoyable from a uh, health standpoint, from a number of hours worked. Uh, my wife was in residency at the time in Philadelphia. We were freezing our ass off in the Northeast, which you know still don't make no damn sense while people live in that part of the world, but um, the basketball and the chance, the edification that came from that, I, it just can't be matched. All right, Coach Will, yeah, oh, Will, one second, just to get on Good. that. Uh, Coachy University of Maine, you know me, what's up? Um, your red, yellow, green um, kind of matrix, is that, yeah. um, did you create that based in analytics or, you know, how do you quantify the progress and create this uh, matrix? I don't, this isn't something I would present to our team. I felt like when I was, these are always good exercises to go through because you have to explain sort of what you believe. And oftentimes that might mean you don't have it down on paper yet. So this was as I was thinking about how to present it to the group. Um, certainly they're, you know, Coach Bennett at UVA, right? Like they're just not gonna run basically, like hardly ever. Uh, we but, don't either. <laughs> so there you go. So like there are certain philosophies that, but by and large, I'd say the, you know, the big fat part of any curve is going to be, yeah, you're running when it's obvious running situations and you're not running when it's, but the big middle part is sort of what you think about your identity of your team's going to be. And really to me, that's like, how do you think you're going to score? And what do you, what environment do you feel like is going to be best for your guys to maximize your, your points per possession? I'm, I, it was one of the worst math students of all time. And so I think the, the value and the opportunity, you know, much like not having been exposed to international basketball before I got to the gym at Texas during the summertime, once you start being around people that use different um, idioms to understand the game and have training, you know, like our GM was had an MBA from Stanford and uh, our, our assistant GM, was a MIT graduate and those guys spoke and approached the game from a totally different level than I did. And it made me start to study things like opportunity cost and arbitrage and variance and risk aversion and things that helped me round out my thinking about the game, despite not being able to, you know, 
don't know what a logarithm was from an algorithm, but I, uh, I saw such power in it and the tools that we developed, that they developed and I helped with while I was in both Philly and Brooklyn uh, were so clearly had a great deal of leverage to offer for coaches and helped me in my own individual coaching. So um, I think I probably have, um, I certainly think of the game. I try to be analytical in the way I think about the game and I value quantitative tools uh, much in the same way that I think we all value qualitative ways of scouting, but um, the the matrix was just an effort by me to try to, in my own mind, create sort of a mental model for how to think about running. Thank you. Thank you. Coach, Coach question. Uh, yes, sir. Dwayne Joshua here. Um, obviously, on a, on a professional level, you know, um, question you got, you got a lot of players that there were once you know, great scores and you know, did a lot of uh, individual things for their respective colleges or whatnot. Um, what's the, the, the biggest thing as far as managing the egos and getting those players to buy into your system initially? You know, how, did, how did you go about that when you first step into that initial position? Well, I think um, my coach and the guy I worked for in Philadelphia, Brett Brown, said players want to know if you can help them. And part of that is competency and part of that is trust. And so um, approaching individuals as people and trying to get to know them and trying to be vulnerable and um, do what you say you're going to do. Like all those things are kind of obvious, but I, I start there with um, the relationships with our guys is, is a huge part of not just what I focus on and spend time on, but that I try to help my staff prioritize. And um, I honestly think I could have done a much better job this year in modeling the behavior of, um, you know, things you say that are important, how much time do you spend on them as compared to things that you have to do. But, um, you know, if you're spending 50% of your time on a scouting report, like that might keep you from getting yelled at during a game. But as the leader of a program, I'm focused on trying to create an environment where I'm praising the things either explicitly or in the way I act that line up with my value system. And so um, I would much rather us be a little less prepared and you know that Jay Sean's girlfriend just um, graduated from grad school at Ohio State and that Michaela wants to be a coach and she's thinking about college or pro. Like I would much rather you connect with your player that you're working with um, than tell me what, you know, 42 blue twist is that Adelaide runs. So the that's the trust piece i think the competency piece um I, I suppose this is sort of an overlap between the two but i i really like coaching pros because you can be straightforward about um the money aspect of business and say hey so you know i might get fired tomorrow you might get cut tomorrow nba you might get traded tomorrow um in the meantime while we're together how can i help you get rich like what can i do like I'm gonna wake up every day thinking about how to make you a lot of money and play for a lot of seasons. And you know why? Like part of that's because I'm a good guy, but part of it is if that happens, somebody could be like, damn, Will sure did help Spencer Dinwiddie make some more money. Like maybe I should hire Will and maybe that'll help my family secure a better opportunity for myself. So can we just agree that while we're together that you're gonna take my criticism and my feedback and I'm gonna take all the things you have to teach me in a way that's mutually beneficial and focused on something that's in your best interest and my best interest. And um, I think that that's how I, I appreciated bosses that were uh, straight up like that with me and colleagues that uh, acknowledge that there is a part of this game that we don't talk about, which is that if you're making it your career, um, that it matters to you. And I think I've learned those lessons probably better from the former players that, that played at a very high level that I've worked with who, you know, oftentimes were drew a harder line with players than I would because they had lived that life. And that said, come on, man, like I'm trying to feed my family and you're going to play like that. Like hell no. And that, that was really helpful for me to see um, and listen to, you know, Trajan Langdon come into our G league practice and sit our guys down and read them the riot act after I'm trying to like keep it positive after we get our ass kicked, you know, like all that kind of stuff um, is really educational 
for um, for any of us. But I, I think you know, I think back to hearing Etienne Messina talk at a clinic where he said the challenge that faces uh, great players, former players who coach, is that they assume their experience, the, the player they're working with is feeling the same way they felt and that they experiencing the same things or things in the same way that they experienced them. But the obvious benefits is that they walked in their shoes. The challenge for a player, a person like me that didn't play at a high level is that um, I don't know what it feels like to be sitting in the locker room before a big game and have to be relied upon to score 20 or get 15 rebounds. Um, but the opportunity I have is that that means I can I don't assume that I know and that I can talk to that player and connect with them based on what they're experiencing. So all of us have individual kind of jury journeys to understand how we can relate best to players. But at the end of the day, you got to convince them that you can help them. And that means you better be prepared. And that means that you better be trustworthy. Coach, I have a question. This is Nick Wade hey, in college. Um, you used some verbiage earlier. Sorry, you said that you got it from another coach. You said drop, hit from the bottom and drop, I believe. Can you please explain that, what you were it's talking on, about? I was, I was just trying so to understand it. On the diagrams on the, on the middle and right, you'll see like the five in the middle diagram and the two in the, in the right diagram. This is a little, um, I'm overemphasizing it in these diagrams because of how important I feel like it is. If you think about the different ways people defend screening actions um the we like to say up to touch is let's say 75 percent of them so whether you hedge you know hard show switch trap um you know next is a new kind of you know people are coming off the closest person a lot of those kinds of defenses all of them can be solved with a really simple idea which is you're trying to create two on one by hitting the bottom and going to the basket so that is sort of the essence of offense, in my opinion, is, is trying to create that two-on-one. If you don't get underneath the player, now it allows the player guarding the ball handler to navigate that screen without anyone needing to help them. So we really focus on hit the bottom and roll. We also have hit as a part of our terminology elsewhere in our offense, and I really hate that, that there's overlap there so I would love it if somebody in this talk um, maybe goes away and comes back and gives me a better idea for how to change my hit the bottom and roll um, philosophy or maybe or terminology or maybe can help me change this other word that I'll, I'll talk about when we get to screening opportunities and, and different kinds of roles I'm, a, I'm just mindful of, the, of everybody's time I'm gonna charge ahead a little bit with some of these transition clips and then we'll maybe take some more questions at the end um, so this is, as I was talking about, sort of an example of anybody getting the rebound, busting out aggressively, and all of his teammates running wide to give him space to go play one-on-one. -on -one. We play a lot of one-on-one -on -one in our practice sessions, um, and we, our eye, guys' eyes got big, and we trained them to get excited about the, the chance to play one-on-one -on -one, um, because we know how difficult that is to guard. So the bottom clip is an example of that, where if someone does help, it's a pretty clean read about where the help came from and make a... a a precise pass to that player. Um, but in this case, JT has got the chance to get in there, pivot, <laughs> take his time and, and create a rim shot. The picks and hooks would be this exemplified in these two examples. So this is where we've got, um, we're prioritizing screens being set by our bigs and they're going to be on ball screens. So in attack break. Hey, Coach Weaver. Um, yes, sir. I think it's, I think it's chopping up. Is yep. it chopping up for everybody? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'll I'll pull it up on mine and then okay, cool. let you talk and you just tell me when to go. Perfect. Thank you. This Australian Wi Fi ain't what it do. Yes, yeah, I, I see I see it ain't very good, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just Appreciate stop sharing your, your screen. Coach. Yep. And I'll do mine. So while you're pulling that up, I'll just talk about the, the on-ball philosophy with our picks and hooks. If you'll just go to the next slide. Yep, one more. One more. Perfect, one more. We'll, uh, we were talking a lot about the location of our teammates so that we can read. Sorry, one more back, Coach. 
So we oh. want to create good spacing, something that our ball handler can make easy reads from, whether it's in this attack break environment as they're bringing it or in picks and hooks, um, which is, you know, drag, double drag, L. Um, but with our, the way we started the season, um, one more clip ahead coach, our backup center is a kind of like Dirk Nowitzki type, whereas our starting center was Andrew Bogut. So we played a very different style with Bogut in the game um, and then Daniel Kickert in the game. And here you can see in the top clip, Dan Kickert involved in this screen puts a lot of fear in the defense. So two players are indecisive about who's going to stay with him and it ends up creating a driving lane for our guard. All of these clips are from the same game against uh, Perth, which is a team we faced in the finals as well. Um, so I just wanted to exemplify all the different ways we came into this game without Bogut. And so we said from the jump, we're going to be running after misses, makes. And I think it shows the, the quantity of clips you're going to look at shows how a mindset of running can um, be as important as any of the specific things that you do. The screening angles, as we touched on earlier, are very important. So in this bottom clip, when it starts back over, you'll see our big trying to get underneath the defense and we call it a hook for that reason. He's coming up from the nail to set this screen with his butt towards the baseline. And then because the defense is dropping, our guards are looking to gnash, drive the ball into the paint, probe, and their teammates are looking for windows. So we used windows as an analogy for help the ball see you. It's a lonely feeling to have to go in there and finish against opponents bigs at the rim as a guard. And so when you're driving, your teammates should, if they're not able to see you, you're not able to see them. They should be trying to work within those windows to create a target for you to pass to. Go to this next slide for me. We'll now move to, um, our corners look. So this is the, what we came up with midway through the year that we felt like could leverage um, the versatility of our forwards and provide opportunities for us to use our depth and athleticism to our advantage. So the first one is an example after a make of our big inbounding it and throwing it quickly to Casper Ware, who just beats the, team, the defense down the floor and gets a layup. We didn't attack the middle of the floor here um, so you see the help that comes. We would just praise our guys for getting to the basket, like getting to the paint uh, and then making the appropriate decision. Uh, Kenny Atkinson had a great line about how everybody wants to be a point guard. Everybody's obsessed about being a point guard. Like you want to be the point guard, make the right decision and then do it again and then do it again and then do it again. Like in any, this play, this game is a game of decisions. So um, if you draw help, your teammates should be running along with you to create windows and provide angles for you to find them. And if you don't make that pass or you don't finish the shot, then that's the kind of thing that we're going to address in a development environment in subsequent days. Running this way, running in any way, oftentimes creates cross matches. Um, and so I think you need to identify as a, a program, whether you're going to be a, a team that tries to pick on matchups and whether it's by posting the mismatch or ISOing, you know, a small on a big, or if you're a team that's going to try to let the ball do the work and um, be more focused on making the defense break down, maybe providing the defense a chance to switch back. Obviously, the shot clock has a huge part to do with this. Um, we were primarily a target team this year. We, we worked a lot on ISOing. We worked a lot on post spacing. Um, with a mismatch here. And that's the option we take advantage of in this case with Jay Sean being guarded by a guy that we were trying to go at on defense. A couple more examples as we flip through here of how corners played out. If you, if you feel like it's useful to you, um, I think there's the one-on-one -on -one part. We, you know, we don't want to just run down to run offense. Then there's, you can play with the guy in the corner or you can play with the guy in trail. So here we are using the guy in the corner, uh, a really bad example of the type of dribble handoff that we'd like here. Jay Sean just lets the defender slide completely underneath him. And to your question earlier, coach, like that's a good example of how the angle of that DHO is, is as important as the angle of an on-ball screen. You, letting the defender slide through like this basically eliminates the value of it. Um, on the flip side, we don't force a switch. This is where good players can tell me to go suck eggs because he gets the ball in the post and makes a great read and passes it to the opposite side of the floor. We get a wide open shot out of it. So um, was it perfect? No, but it happened at speed. It had good spacing behind it. 
and there was a share mentality that was being applied to the offensive side of the ball. And so all of that, I think, is going to beat precise, perfect joystick kind of coaching nine times out of 10. When you're running in this bottom clip, you can see how the player ahead of the ball handler actually has the better mismatch. He's got a small on him. We ideally, we'd love for him to turn and post here and we could sort of pick on that. But again, because we come at speed, the help's not prepared to rotate and we get another uncontested rim shot just by advancing the ball quickly and putting one of our better players in a spot on the floor early enough that the defense has a hard time for accounting for him. One more ahead, A.B. These are examples of playing with um, the trail. So we had our big, our five man very often in deep drops. So you'll see, even though I talked about how anybody can inbound it, still I'd say the majority of time, our five ended up being the inbounder because of where he was deployed defensively. When it was Daniel Kicker, who I compare favorably to Dirk, I think Dan shot like 45 or 46% from three this year. Um, it's such a weapon, you know, to the point where I, I made a big deal out of making his nickname weapon and making sure everybody was aware of him, where he was on the floor at all times and trying to increase his shots. So we talked about shooting deeper ones, shooting earlier ones, shooting contested ones. Part of that was he was a great shooter. Part of it also was that he made me look like um, Eric Bledsoe driving the basketball. So the less t dribbles he took, the better it was for the Sydney Kings. His gravity allowed Jay Sean to basically fake a handoff to him uh, just a minute later into the game and turn it, turn the corner for a dunk because of how scared people were of lo losing track of Dan in transition. So as always, shooting makes us all look geniuses um, with our X's and O's and the offensive group that played with Dan, almost anything we ran looked good. The group that we played with Bogut took a little bit more uh, strategy to try to move pieces around. Will, yep. Anthony Figueroa from Parkland College. Hey, coach. So on these last couple, last few clips, Jay Sean has been the point guard. Am, am I seeing that correctly? Like he's been the we one would, pushing it. We tried to prioritize. Very often teams would try to deny Casper full court. And so from the beginning of the season, I really de-emphasized the idea of us having a point guard and was trying to focus on a more equal opportunity, more drive and kick oriented kind of approach. But you're right, he's bringing the ball because he's usually guarding Perth's four man who's close to the basket. So our rules were the two lowest guys were the two outlet candidates. If JT were contesting a shot at the top of the key, his job would be to run wide and get to a corner and then make a read based on whoever else was bringing it. Okay, that was my question was, were, was everybody else aware that Jay Sean was going to be the one on the push. But if, I'll tell you if, what, if, if it's already been 18 of these buckets that he had, he, he went nuts <laughs> this game. And, you know, our players are smart enough um, to get him the basketball because Perth couldn't do anything with him. So JT was first team all league for us this year and was so versatile in his ability to drive, pass, uh, and post. Um, and his shooting improved as well. But um, a big part of choosing to play like this was my excitement level in getting him in these environments. Okay. Thank you. Absolutely. One more ahead, Ebi. Just a couple of concepts that aren't integral to the scheme, but I think if you want to try to rev up the way you run um, or you're trying to deal with a team that offensive rebounds effectively, Perth was one of the best offensive rebounding teams in the league. They usually crashed four guys and we struggled um, within the rules to box them out. And so we started to use flybys as a concept to punish that aggression on their part. So um, our rule was just a jump shooter that you were contesting that triggered you the freedom to fly by. And here in this example, you know, Xavier gets ahead of everybody and uses his athleticism to finish. Um, I think that's a nice tweak you can make to try to rev up your aggression offensively of course, you feel pretty naked when they get the offensive rebound and your guys standing at midcourt, but um, you, you got to sort of pick your poison. And we felt like that was a way to take some aggression back on a, against a team that was crashing really hard against us. And then we started the year with pistol, you know, connected with sort of those D'Antoni principles. I really like the idea of delay, a five out set with Bogut at the top of the key making decisions. So, you know, D'Antoni for a long time has used his 21 series or pistol to connect with that spacing. 
I thought it was going to be a big part of our offense. It really didn't have much teeth and our guys didn't embrace it. Um, but when we started to run like this with interchangeable parts, they would find pistol spacing just out of the natural flow of things. So even though guys weren't in the exact right spot, you know, this little small, small into a flare suddenly has some teeth to it when you're coming with this kind of speed. And um, that's exactly the kind of thing that Mike would always talk about with our teams in Philly that we're trying to trick our way into scoring without any shooting and um, being outmatched on uh, most nights. Um, and now I think with the firepower he's gotten, you see just how dangerous he can get fast, slow, or other lots. Hey, Coach Weaver. Uh, yes, sir. We are, we are Raheem, Kennesaw State here. Okay. Question for you. Um, it, and I'm probably thinking more along the lines of college guys, right? But most college most college guys are running, you know, five to the rim. And I know uh, Coach Daryl LaBerry asked about this earlier. How how long did it take you to get your guys? Uh, because I'm just thinking, like, if it's college, right, and you're telling our it's equal opportunity and anybody can push it, I'm just imagining most guys waiting around for that outlet, right? So how did how long did it get you? How long did it take you to get your guys? All right, when they realized they didn't get, they weren't gonna get that outlet, or they weren't taking it out to get to those spots down the court. Well, I'll say that. Um, there's definitely a adjustment period when you try to run like this. Uh, we started the year in Long Island running because I knew our shooting was going to be bad. And um, I felt like that was fitting uh, a variety of priorities we had as a development program for the Brooklyn Nets, you know, trying to play with a great deal of energy, trying to play a lot of guys. Um, you know, it's easier to sell a deeper rotation um, and in, preach the importance, you know, for us, this is a building block year for our franchise in terms of a new head coach and trying to establish some habits that matter. So the value of running wasn't just in terms of how it might help our team, but also in terms of the, the lending support to the behaviors that we were hoping they would adopt from a fitness and a recovery standpoint, um, as well as holding true to the promises we made to play, you know, deep team and play play minutes with guys that deserved it so um the the disease of looking back for the ball and everybody wanting to be the point guard you know i think of coaching in lots of ways as either creating to a cycle or just cycles and so that's one of those where it's like one guy does it and now everybody does it and now nobody's running um so i think you're early on trying to find opportunities to praise and reward the behaviors that um will lead to a virtuous cycle being created. You know, you see some of these clips, it's pretty impressive how quickly they go from defense to offense, um, which is something that Michigan State's teams always did exceptionally well. That was another team we played, I think every year I was at Texas and um, the difficulty of dealing with such a good defensive team that got as many stops as they did that was so committed to running as a team uh, stuck with me. The um, I think the, the flip side to that is we tried to be the fastest team in the league my first year with Philadelphia 76ers. And we had so many young guys on our team that scores stopped feeling like a problem. You know, we were so focused on getting the ball out of the net that Michael Carter Williams and Tony Roten and Nerlens Noel and these guys might not have learned the lessons that they would be learning in another environment because we were focused on inbounding the ball quickly and getting it ahead where really we just had a god awful defensive possession and gave up a layup and nobody's really acting like that's a problem. So I, in my heart of hearts, I believe that that is more fake toughness than real toughness. That's sort of like oh, almost stomp around and you know, the, the game isn't the time to be, in my view, critiquing your players and having them playing with a, you know, worried about getting, making a mistake or being criticized or, you know, there's nothing worse than a coach telling guys where to pass to, where to dribble um, in the middle of a basketball game, in my view. So I try, I try very firmly to hold to that. Um, but there is some tension there between, you know, both our team, both the past two years, the teams I've coached. Like I said, I, I've recruited guys with a defensive mindset. Um, Xavier Cooks at one point was like, man, I, I get all this like force and mid-range stuff, but like, can we just make some people miss now and again? I'm tired of watching get like just hoping they miss. And that's the kind of edge you want your players to have. Um, but 
I think that if you explain the why and you help them understand it, it's to our team's advantage, it's to your advantage to play fast. And this is the kind of things it's going to take. That's ultimately our job as coaches is to show them the why and help them buy into it. And our guys got there and it really helped us. Hey coach, I got a question. This coach branch from Manchester Day Academy. Hey coach. Um, last year, hey, how you doing? Last year I had a very athletic team. So we dunked the ball a lot. So we really couldn't shoot. So we wanted to run. <laughs> I could have guessed. Year, <laughs> so this year, and I heard, you know, your team, you said your team wasn't the best shooting team. So this year I recruited a very good shooting team. So should I still emphasize run, run, run? Now that I got a lot of shooters, how could I get, you know, should I slow it down so we can play by threes now? Or how would you do that if if you got a shooting team? You, you get what I'm saying? Yes, sir. And I, you know, that's – the kind of puzzle I think we're all wrestling with. I, I would not for a second pretend to know more about your team than you do. I would trust your instinct on that front. Um, the kinds of things I take into consideration when I am planning for a season, um, I'm trying to think about, and this is actually an idea from uh, Rob Lucero at Austin Westlake who talked about like, what, what are you going to have to do to beat the team you need to beat? You know, like look ahead and um, this actually goes back hand in hand, I think, with sort of strategic thinking. Um, you know, what sort of, there's, there's good risk and there's bad risk, right? So if to keep your job, you got to win the championship next season, bring on the risk, baby. Let's fire up a bunch of threes. Let's um, play guys minutes that might lead them to get injured, but gives them an opportunity to, uh, you know, your best players are on the floor as much as possible. Let's take some dudes with some character issues and hope it pans out. Like, come on. And if that's what your boss, you know, if that's what your boss is rewarding, they should be savvy enough to realize that. Uh, if on the other hand, you know, it's you got to win 50% of your games, that should lower your uh, risk-seeking behavior, make you a little more risk, more risk averse. Shooting just helps, right? Like all of us want shooters. It makes us look like we know what we're doing. Um, there's no there's no defense that can stop a guy that can shoot the basketball except for not letting them get the basketball. So you're not going to be wrong. I would be thinking about the impact it's going to be have on your defense. So um, the head coach of the Australian Institute of Sport here in Australia, who does an amazing job. He's coaching a development program, basically a prep school, some of the best Australian basketball players, but also they have the NBA Academy, the head NBA Academy is based out of there. And so, um, you know, I listened to a clinic from him the other day and he talked about how, Everybody says, you know, every job interview, I'm going to play fast. We're going to be a style play. Our players are going to love to play. Our, our AD is going to love it. The fans are going to love it. Uh, we're going to shoot a lot of threes. It's the modern game. And that's all great. The trick is what are the implications of that? So we're going to miss more shots, one, right, just by – it's a higher value shot shooting threes, but we're going to miss more just by the, the nature of um, – field goal percentages. So are we going to offensive rebound them better? Are we going to be a committed transition defensive team? Um, and are we going to be able to cope with the, the mental challenge of missing shots? Um, are we going to behave, you know, so throw up our hands and put on a show every time we miss a shot? Uh, are we going to complain to the officials when we think we got fouled, sticking our leg out, trying to draw shooting fouls? Um, those would be things I would be thinking about because just like I probably could have guessed you're badass bunch of velociraptors couldn't shoot that great. I'm guessing your kick-ass shooters might not be the most tough-minded, laterally quick defensive uh, stoppers on the other side of the floor too, right? Yes, so sir. Gonna, that's you, a, that's you a to, great guess. <laughs> you're going to figure out some ways to hide those Will Weavers you got running around back there. Hey, Coach Craig Wanda, uh, congratulations Black, on your Black. season this year. Black. I got, What's up, Black? I got, hey, um, question. Hey, Jeremy. I can't. My, my computer breaking up. Can you hear me? Let's let's hold the questions till the end, so Coach Weaver can get all the way through, and then we can answer the questions at the end. I got I got I got to pick on you, Black. So everybody, if you can hold the questions. Oh, uh, go, go ahead, go ahead. So Craig, do the whole thing. Does your question apply to this though? You yeah, might have a question about this specific slide. It, it really does. Not this slide, but the previous slide. Like, okay, we'll how, go with it then. How I'm how, my are you, how are you teaching and practice? Your 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 running styles and your trans your uh, traditional cycle because it looks like every it's it's why it, your wings are running wide everybody's running but how are you teaching this in practice when nothing is really set? 
we play a ton of five on five, you know, our time together at Texas where coach Barnes was big on using those cycles to name everything. Um, I feel like the starting from the other end and saying, look, we're trying to get to the basket. You know, like we're trying to put fouls on people. We're trying to get layups. And in order for that to happen, we need people to give you space to drive the basketball. Um, and then we're going to try to make simple reads from that. So if your teammate is open, we'd like you to pass on the basketball that emphasis and then teaching it and reviewing it in five on five, then making it back, you know, once we've sort of done that whole method approach, now we, we call them vitamins, right? We steal the San Antonio Spurs stuff like everybody. So we have daily vitamins where our guys get individual workouts with an assistant coach. In my old life, that was me sitting with, you know, our two way players or Spencer or somebody and being like, Hey man, I'm gonna keep it real with you. If you don't throw this pass, like, we ain't going to win very many games, bro. <laughs> like it's going to be hard for you to get this other contract. If damn Joe Harris don't see this basketball come to him right here. And he's like, yeah, you want, but look at what I, I got to the rim. Like, what do you want me to do? So that's where the reinforcement of your team principles by the guys working with the players and they're in the trenches every single day working with them. Is it technique? Are they selfish? Do they just not see it? Um, I felt like we've gotten more value out of that than trying to have a, um, you know, they talk about like blocked practice where, okay, now you three man weave is a classic example. Okay, you throw it here, then you throw it here. There's no decision making. There's no um, richness to the experience. It's just sort of rote memory. We try to eliminate that as often as possible from our training sessions and try to play in the way the game is played and teach within that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I will maybe skip ahead quickly. AB, we're, what are we doing on time? Do you want to touch on any elbow stuff? You want to cut it here? It's up to you. I have, I have none but time, but <laughs> it's up to you. Um, I'll tell you what, I'll, I, I, I'll I introduce this concept. People. And if there's questions on it, I'll maybe you can just scroll through it regularly and people can stop, say, go back to something if they're interested in it. Um, yeah, just if you, have any, if you have any questions, write, write down. What, what question it. you have on what slide and, uh, cool. and then we'll come back to it. And I, I'm happy to stay later, go individual with anybody too, if any of this stuff is interesting. Um, I wanted to just cover off on the other end of the spectrum. So, you know, our, our nominally our best player, Andrew Bogut, I think I looked at as an opportunity to coach one of the most unique players in the game. Um, his passing ability, his vision, um, his toughness screen setting, like just all in the 99th percentile. And so I was really excited about that challenge as a coach to learn from him and having worked with him now in a couple of different international campaigns, I saw firsthand just how unique he is. Um, we put in um, a set with the national team this last World Cup that we thought would leverage him better than we did in previous campaigns. Uh, I argued for the diagram you'll see in the bottom right, which is sort of the, the way we got into it. Um, my boss felt like there was a better way to get into it based on the style of play we had previously. That's the diagram you see at the top left, um, but essentially the same kind of actions evolved from it. So um, when I talk about wide, that's what we did with the national team. When I talk about pistol mid, which I named just because it was a lot like some of the pistol options just in the middle of the floor, um, you'll see how we did it with the Sydney Kings. So the top right example is what we'll start with first, AB, if you want to skip ahead to this next slide, I'm just going to walk you through some options out of it. But all of this is using Bogut as a decision maker at the elbow, except for the first one, which because we started it with a wide pin down, you know, we had really good shooters. So Joe Ingles and Patty Mills, Chris Golden, the guy some of you guys might not know, but a really good shooter in our league. Um, so the chance to just have them scream off this wide pin down was good for us. The problem is we felt like Bogut's man would be in the way of the curl if he was standing at the elbow already. So we would call wide hold as a way to signal that you're going to stay down in the dunker bogues and we're going to really try to score out of this wide pin down. I wish it was a little bit more free flowing um, as opposed to dictating that ahead of time. But you can see the advantage of it now is Bogut's here and a good example to get a hand on a ball and potentially get an offensive rebound. One thing he did really well was um, identify teams top locking or denying this cut. And so guys trying to take away the, the cut by Patty Mills here, you know, Team USA, who we had to give that beating to down in Melbourne uh, earlier last year, they, uh, they got a little messed up here, which showed probably why, they, why they, they went out of the tournament relatively early. But 
again, Bogut's just um, touch, feel, confidence, size, uh, all that stuff made every one of these actions dangerous. Skipping ahead, you'll see a few more involvements now with the guards getting involved. So this guy could come off this curl even if the ball had gone to the elbow, in which case the guy making the initial entry pass would read that he's coming off for a handoff just to try to balance the floor. In the bottom example, what we'd call splits, you've got Matthew Delvadova going to set a screen for another really good shooter and reading that his man's jumping out, slips hard to the basket and Bogues rewards him for a layup. So that split action and giving guys the freedom to screen their own man against switching, slip against switching um, and take advantage of as a continent, our guys take a lot of pride in their physical toughness. And so using our guards as screen setters, which we all know are the dirtiest, nobody's dirtier screening than guards. Um, and Delhi would be surely at the top of that list as one of the great guard screen setters playing professional basketball. Uh, it takes, a, it takes, it surprises Czech Republic here and gets us a layup. On to the next couple of options. Um, you know, I think one tough decision for the defense is just whether they pressure at the elbow or where they try to drop off. And what we learned here in Sydney was that there was no right answer for teams, for defenses. Um, so, you know, here's an example of where Senegal is up trying to sort of drop off Bogues, but now he can see the whole floor is easy for him to basically just hand the ball to one of our best shooters. And you can see how similar this looks to a sort of a delay setup when Patty comes off. You've got the floor balanced now with two guards on one side and a big and a guard on the other side. And so we found their real value in our Sydney environment, connecting our delay reads and our delay terminology with a different way to get into it out of our pistol mid game. Uh, with the Australian team, we let these dudes hoop, you know, Joe Ingles, Patty Mills, Delhi, Bogues, Baines, like the, the collective IQ on the floor at times was staggering. Um, and so We've named things less. We focused less on um, trying to joystick stuff and we were trying to put them in space where they could read. And um, that's what got us to the, the metal games. Coming off this flare, you see the delay pattern come up again here as Bogut takes advantage with a little floater, which he liked a little too much. But again, you're putting the defense now having to guard a wide pin down, a hand back action between Patty and Joey a flare screen set by Bogues, a handoff set by Bogues, and now maybe some off ball screening or an isolation from your, one of your bigs at the elbow. Skip ahead, AB. Thank you for running this, my brother. Appreciate you picking me up. Did I lose you guys? AB. Oh, maybe AB. Fell asleep. Looks like he froze. Thank Coach Tang, I appreciate you. Sometimes you got to wake AB up. We all know that. Just any questions on that, I guess, while we're at a natural little pause point? Hey, yeah, Coach, um, on that split, what, what yes, bothers – what bothers – y'all the most defensively how when teams what what defense like you know we sometimes like sit on top one play underneath take the guy yeah. who go you know the, what bothers you the most i think teams that commit fully to dropping all the way to the rim with their big and baiting you into that floater is one problem you know like we're focused on looking for great shots early in the clock and um, as deep as we played with our drops, we tricked some opponent bigs into running in there and throwing up a prayer. So that was, I think, effective when other people did that to us. In terms of the split action, teams that switch their defenses. So, you know, if you let, if you, if you involve Delhi and Patty in a, a off-ball screening action together or an on-ball action and just gave them the same look every time, they're going to pick you apart. But when suddenly you were switching before, and so they had started to set it more like a flare to create that slip angle to the rim. Now suddenly you start to try to gap it and stay with your own or um, show and recover. That was the type of thing that um, would give you problems because they couldn't, you know, Delhi knew this slip was going to be there the moment he went to go set the screen because of, he recognized they had been switching previously. So I think giving different looks to those players 
in combination with ball pressure. You know, the, the, if you're gonna, if you're gonna be aggressive on the, the any screening coverage, the, the ball pressure starts to become key, which is obviously in contrast to what I said about playing off of off the big. But if you've got a big that can't shoot, um, it tends to be the case. If he's already inside the perimeter, let's go ahead and back up, see if we can't talk him into taking a wide open bad shot that is going to keep Joe Ingles and keep Patty Mills from getting, you know, being the offensive engines that they are for their team. Thank you. You bet. So um, just skipping ahead to how we did it in Sydney. This was the spacing and the, the start that, that I liked better and that I advocated for. Um, we ran something similar uh, during my time in Brooklyn. Just all of this is playing on the side of the big. So this basically is all playing through Bogut's side or the other big we have in his spot. Um, although I thought this was, and I, you know, this was predominantly Bogut set, we found ways to utilize it for other players as well. So in the top left example, you'll see basically just an angle. You know, it's just a, a seam pick and roll set by Bogues, but this is our hit terminology. So to take advantage of teams that drop we would allow him to go be a headhunter and try to go screen for a shooter after he set a screen. Um, at his age too, he wasn't all about rolling hard to the rim every time, but he was happy to go lay some wood. And so this was um, a good counter for teams that tried to uh, drop against us. Um, in the top right, you see just a get game is what uh, my old boss in Philly would call it, but it's just a hand back now instead of a pick and roll. Oftentimes a good way for players that aren't great pick and roll decision makers you know, they treat it more like a running back where you're coming off for a quick handoff and then, you know, they make a, they make a mistake and Bogues makes them pay as he often does. On the bottom left clip, you'll see an action that we use to try to get him across screen. So we just had a elbow hit with a handoff with the corner while our weak side corner, our weak side guard um, basically back cut the split action and set the cross screen for him and a flare just to open up the passing angle. Here, JT decides to drive in and, and do what he does, but um, we were looking for more opportunities to post Bogut as the season went along. So this became a set that we put in to try to get him the ball on the block. And then an example of how we played with other guys in that spot, just the opportunity to isolate. You know, Once we identified that there was a target guy out there, uh, oftentimes that would happen when we played a little smaller. Here we've got our five man in the corner. This is the, our Dirk clone, Dan Kickert which means that now JT has the, the chance to drive against Dave Anderson, if any of you remember that name from back in, um, back in the day, New Orleans Pelicans and Houston Rockets. He's, if you're over 40, we we're probably going to try to isolate you as a general rule here in Sydney. So um, as good of a player as Dave is, um, that was to our advantage. Skip ahead one more, AB. This just shows you playing with the other side of the floor. So that was all stuff that happened with our big side. Um, and, and these were all calls, but I think – you could make an argument that this would be um, maybe fewer options and more variety could be done with reads as opposed to calls. Um, the cut that Casper makes starting at the block, you know, players want to shortcut stuff. So they would just stand at the elbow and allow themselves to be denied some. Here, you know, Bogut, of course, tells him to wait. So he listens to him instead of listening to me. But uh, the speed that that creates ends up putting the defense off balance and I think is a direct uh, connection to the dunk that we end up creating for ourselves. The screening angles are perfect. Um, this was action that James Harden is the first time I saw it was when Mike first went to Houston uh, and started running this for James. And I just found gave us such headaches all over the floor. So um, something we tried to find inside of delay and inside of our, our half court sets. On the top right, you'll see just a common chin look. Uh, Coach Carmody, you know, Coach Tavares would have seen that many times. Uh, and his, his old Princeton life, again, different personnel out there, but an opportunity to play some spread pick and roll after a back screen. We get the back screen once in a blue moon, um, but it's a chance to identify, hey, look, we want to play. This is Didi Luzada with the ball, the New Orleans Pelicans pick that they stashed with us this year. Uh, we felt like he had a matchup, so we were going to try to involve him in a middle pick and roll and get Casper off the ball where they had a, had a decision to make whether they were going to come off of him or not. The bottom two examples, you'll see a stack set or a Spanish pick and roll set. I don't like to call it that because um, they won the bronze medal against us kicking our ass with stack. So I don't call it Spanish pick and roll. I call it stack because I don't like being reminded of that, of that game very much. But um, we would use a flare screen in this example to set up the middle pick and roll. And then we'd come out of the corner to set the back screen. 
what I really liked about this alignment was it was easy to create that stack out of almost any option. So you can easily imagine, you know, in the top right example, Casper could circle back around and set the back screen, the point guard that starts with it, you know, out of chin, he could come back and set it um, out of the crop, the clip you see at the beginning, as the flip happens, you could be coming out of the weak side corner and setting the back screen. So lots of opportunities to create a variable set of looks. And then as we played bigger, there were opportunities to post guards. So this is, we just called duck, which was the big would raise out of the corner and we would throw it to him to try to punch it inside to that guard that was supposed to be starting at the block anyway. Here at Xavier Cooks at the three and it gives us an opportunity to try to force a double team. We make a good pass, but those sticky ass decals, which only international hoopers really know about, um, you know, claim another turnover. So thankfully JT don't hurt himself on it, but we had an epidemic of sticker slips this year, which, you know, is one so of the many questions we have a sense. Yeah, I'm ready. Hit it. Um, on your, and your, and your chance at the top, right. Uh, it looks as though the big misses. Do Hell yeah, you, do it's a rookie. Do you, do you teach twisting if they go under to send them back over to send the, to reroute them back over the top or it kind of mess up your flow? You say it mess up your flow or, how do you Definitely, we had that twist concept in. We used it more on ball than off ball. Um, as a general, as a continent, they don't like not screening very much, even if it's a strategy. So uh, we we tried to focus on setting a screen with a great angle. This to me, I, I've brainwashed myself here. So on ball, off ball, setting the screen in a way where you're hitting the bottom and putting pressure on the basket is just how I see the game. And so. I, the thing I'm working with Jordan after this on this nine hour trip home, they had us playing in this tiny little town in New Zealand, this game for uh, marketing purposes was Jordy, your feet, like you're setting it with your butt to the sideline. That's going to allow Casper's defender to just slide right through. Like you're not even there. So um, definitely not a strategy, but the fact that he moves to the next action is something we praise, you know, like we're not going to get, hung up on you making one mistake. It's now what's next. It's now you got to go set a good screen for DD and then you got to roll your ass off, which he does here. And as a result, he's the one that ends up getting the layup. Um, but this was a game where Bo we, we left Bogut at home because we had a, two flights to this small town in New Zealand. And um, you know, as coach Hardy was talking about earlier, the, the sort of what's next mentality that we preach to our players. We got to have as coaches, you have guys hurt, you have guys miss trips. Good. Like that's a great chance for us to play this rookie meaningful minutes in the middle of our season. And that mindset, I think allowed us to be the first team in league history to lead the competition from the first round to the last round. Um, and more importantly, establish kind of a, who we are as a program moving into subsequent years. I think that's all I got from clips environment. If anybody got specific questions to that or um, want to talk about anything we talked about, I'm, I'm an open book. So hey, Coach Weaver, I just want to good. thank you again for listening to listening to me cover all that. There's a lot of people that want to know if they can have a copy of the PowerPoint. Is it okay if I share it in the chat? Uh, you, anything you want me to take I'll on? think more about that. I might I might make people go through some sort of uh, litmus test to connect with me individually, so that I don't I don't got my my IP that's even better. around. That's 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 less work for me. <laughs> yeah. Well, then I'm, that's definitely how we're gonna do it then. <laughs> so, um, if you can put your email in the chat, I'll put it right now. Yep. And everybody that's asking for it, just reach out for to sure, because we were, um, and I want to thank you. Um, for, you know, taking a time out. I mean, I don't even know what time it is in Australia, but um, thank you for the time. Thank My you pleasure. for Thanks talking for to us. So, um, I know it's a lot, uh, especially going through a lot of sets, and I know I learned a lot. So if you have any questions, please say your name, what school that you're from, and whatever question it is, please don't tell a story. Just ask your question, and let's, let's proceed ahead. Coach Weaver, how's it going? This is uh, Coach Ford from Salem University. Um, we do a lot of these uh, spread uh, pick and roll concepts in, in our offense as well. Um, got a lot of it from Coach D'Antoni. Uh, something we tell our guys, you know, you talked about hitting the bottom. We tell our guys to hit back hit pocket. 
So we tell them, imagine you're wearing a pair of jeans and hit the back hip pocket. Uh, but my question is, when you're uh, explaining and, and talking about these rules, do you always have them, you know, set a solid screen or do you sprint roll out of it sometimes um, like the Rockets did with uh, Capella? We ended up identifying three different ways that we wanted to emphasize a sort of role options. So we would talk about, first of all, defense is going to dictate what we're going to do as a screener and as a, in involved in the screening role. So if anybody's up to touch, our default was hit the bottom and roll. Didn't matter if you were guard setting it, a big setting it. Um, but more specifically, we would talk about like rolling for lobs. Maybe that didn't mean you're going to receive a lob, but that's that Capella type Tyson Chandler back in the day, the whole gym, you know, um, gravity above the rim, you know, a whole nother vert and whole nother uh, plane to deal with. Then there was the short roll, which we would just call like a pocket roll, which was maybe against hedging or blitzing teams. You know, we wanted to get Bogut in that pocket to where now he could be a playmaker and be the quarterback of the gym. And then there was that hit roll, that idea that we we're going to go set wide pin downs. Um, some people would use like the ghost screen terminology where you're going to come up and fake like you're setting one. We didn't feel like you needed to fake one. Why don't go ahead and just set the damn on ball and then go set another damn wide pin down for another shooter. It felt more valuable to us than faking like you were going to set a screen um, if you were that kind of player. But we, we really tried to prioritize our guys communicating to each other and solving problems on the floor and hope that, you know, in a noisy environment, when a team suddenly starts to switch defenses, that they are gonna, they're the ones playing the game, that they should see stuff happen before we do. And if we had a terminology around it, then we could all be on the same page, but um, we certainly weren't dictating to them, hey, you have to lob roll every time you screen, um, unless we really were sucking at it. And we said, all right, from this point forward, all we're gonna do is pocket roll and, and play four on three behind it first. Man, you must have done a great job. Nobody have any questions. I appreciate it. Hey, Coach, actually, I got, I got one real quick. Um, sure. Jordan Bailey, I'm assistant Washtenaw Baptist. We're D2 in Arkansas. Um, what, uh, what metrics are you looking at, you know, on a game-by-game -game basis? I know analytics you touched on a little bit. You know, what are there certain metrics that you're looking at every night and, and making evaluations based off those? Not game-to-game. -game. I think um, – you know, they talk about how stats can be used like a drunk person uses a lamppost for support or illumination. Like, I think there's a lot of truth in that. Uh, it, sometimes we need to trick players into doing what we know is already right. And we might use stats in that way. But when we do that, it's few and far between. And we go into it um, understanding that's why we're doing it, you know. This player has shot 68 free throws in the last three games. Like, y'all better not foul his ass. Don't think he shot 12 free throws. Nobody's looking that up, right? The When we're trying to learn things, we're staying away from small sample sizes as much as we can. And that's a real challenge in a college season or a season like the NBL where there's only 28 games um, and 40-minute games. So I think we're all likely to trick ourselves into – coming to the wrong conclusion if we're looking at anything on a game by game basis but in general right like we know uh, descriptively what wins basketball games like we can predict with accuracy uh, what the four factors and how those combine to describe winning so um, and the proportionality of those so like shooting you know EFG is pretty much everything like shooting percentage is the biggest chunk of that and the defensive approach we chose um, is widely used across the NBA and a lot of college teams because it gives you three uh, of the four uh, opportunities to be great in three of the four areas. You don't create many turnovers, but you keep people's EFG super low. You improve your defensive rebounding chances and you don't foul as often. So at least from uh, an analytic standpoint, those were things that if we were giving up a lot of offensive rebounds or we were fouling a lot, um, or we were giving up three point attempts to good shooters, like something's wrong. Like we, something's broken down in what we were doing defensively um, and trying to reinforce and, and teach our guys why we viewed the game that way 
And as someone else spoke about, you know, taking ownership of like, hey, if, if they make this shot, it's on me. Like if they make this mid-range pull up with 20 on the clock, like that's on the coaching staff. You got no responsibility for that. And then eventually growing to a standpoint like, all right, well, can we still contest it? Can we avoid the screen even better? Like let's not concede just an open shot, even if it's the one that we prefer um, that to some of the more high value ones. And so um, trying to use some of the numbers to identify what happened, which is what numbers are good for, but then use the film to identify how it happened, why it happened, and what the hell we're going to do about it um, is our approach. Coach, uh, Timothy P, UNCG men's basketball. I got a question about your in-game adjustments and timeouts. It's like you say you have Andrew Bogut. How often do you bounce ideas off him or do you just let him have sometimes give him the timeout or let your guys just kind of just cut? I guess you guys do a lot of 5 and 5 and 5 in practice and they kind of know what each other want to do. How much freedom do you give, give those guys? A ton. I, I think um, I certainly am not batting a thousand on this, but I um, two things that always struck me as aspects that I didn't want our players to feel like on teams that I coached because of teams I was a part of before the timeout is a chance to get away from the stress of the game for a minute and catch your breath and compose yourself. And so I never wanted our huddles to feel anxious. Um, I very rarely wanted to come in there guns a blazing and smacking our guys around. Cause I was pissed. If I felt like that's what they needed for me, then I would bring that and, you know, unleash, some authentic frustration with what we were doing um, and fill my role as the mirror to hold up to them to try to be a relatively um, objective viewer of what was going on. But I was focused on coming into those environments to give them a chance to catch their breath, compose themselves and prepare for what could be adjusted to help them perform. Um, I'm a huge believer in identifying explicitly with your teams the value of like practice, you know, a drill that you do at half speed should be damn near perfect. A drill, of, you know, if you're playing five on five and in practice, it should feel kind of like a game, but like you can't stop a game. So to suddenly start behaving in a way where you're really um, chopping up their performance and saying, um, God damn it, Bogues, like fucking roll. Like that to me is not the best use of our time. It's like, all right, well, can I design a set that will show Bogues how valuable rolling is based on how the team is driving, playing him? Um, and it take, hell, carries a hell of a lot more weight if Bogues gets on our guys about taking bad shots than if I get on our guys about taking bad shots. And one thing I had to overcome was he was so mindful of giving me deference in my first year. Yeah, I'm 35 years old. I'm a foreigner. Um, I'm coaching this league for the first time. And uh, halfway through the year, I was like, I need more from you. I feel like you can, like, there's opportunities for you to stamp your foot and say, what the hell sometimes and pull me up when I'm, he said, well, I'm just trying to give you space to do you, you know, and not be all up over the top of you. And so I, I was like, that's the last thing I want. The last thing I care about is you showing me up. Like, you got good ideas. We need them. Like, don't, don't just be deferential to me. Cause I'm, I'm the new kid. Like, fuck that. Like we got to win some basketball games. And so just creating space for those conversations to happen really benefited our team. Uh, and as a credit to his character and his experience that he would even have that sort of mindset, but um, I'm, I'm probably new school in that way and really comfortable in my skin in that. So I, I like players that, argue I like players that want to go back at me about stuff and I like players that are happy for me to do the same um Bo get checked out of the game like four or five minutes into game three of the finals and was having a go at me about the shots we were taking and I had to go right back at him about the points we were hemorrhaging um and that's just all good like bullets are flying that's part of it you know thank you all right if, if anybody have one last question A.B., I don't have a question. I have um, a comment for Coach Hardy and uh, Coach Weaver. Uh, I'm the street sweeper. Um, Coach Hardy, the people in Baltimore, they love you. Uh, they say you're a genuine person, and uh, you are who you perceive 
to me. So I like to give people their credit and they just do. Um, Coach Weaver, I got several texts because I reached out to some people and they said, you're a grinder. They said you went from being a manager, flying all over the court at Texas, wiping out every wet spot and you earned your keeps so or where you at, you know, self-made, worked hard, um, heard about the story, moving to PA with your um, with your wife and, you know, climbing up the ladder. So respect the real guys coming on to be ready. And uh, I think that's what be ready is about, you know, having real people or real stories that we can relate to showing us that you can still be successful depending on what your path is. Thank you, Coach Down. Thank you again. I really value the chance to meet all y'all. If I can do anything for anybody, just please shoot me an email or drop me a message. Appreciate that too, Jareen. I want to thank Coach Hardy, thank Coach Weaver, both for taking the time out to share their knowledge. Um, I know I have a lot of notes here, and so I appreciate them. And so how we end at Be Ready is pass the tang, take us home. Hey, um, I know we have a, first of all, this is unbelievable. Thanks, Will. Really appreciate it. Uh, Tavares, you know, really, really appreciate it. Um, I know we have a couple of guys on here that are head coaches and you're getting ready to go into your second or your third year. And uh, I, I, one of the questions that keeps coming up, I say is like, uh, how do you make that next step or how do you evaluate it? You know, I, I, I don't know. I'm, now, but I know that one of the tools that I've heard, um, Coach Drew always told us this, that uh, Tim Floyd would say he would put his roster down, like his starting five, and then he'd get everybody's roster in the league and look and say, my one against their one, my two against their two. And, and if he could win four of the five positions, they said, all right, we're going to have a good year. And if it was you win three out of the five, then, you know, you had a chance to have a good year. Some things had to go right. And then two out of the three, you know, and just kind of evaluating that before you figured out, okay, how we're going to make these guys play, you know, as you're making decisions. I thought that was one of the things as an assistant for coach, understanding his mindset, how we could help. Cause we could sit in meetings and he would say something, you know, it, it could be like he's, cause head coaches, y'all always worried about something. So um, he could be talking about, you know, well, I don't know if we're this or we're that. And I'd be like, hey, let's put the rosters up. You know, five guys up there, we'll pick a team. Uh, we're winning at least three spots. And, you know, and, and then now we could get on to the next thing about getting better. And so I, I don't know who to, if that helps anybody or not, but it just came to mind as I was listening uh, to you guys um, talk about that. And, uh, but, uh, man, this has been, been unbelievable. I know uh, we've had a list of prayer requests, G., uh, you want to give us an update on Pops? How's things going? Bags are still packed. Uh, so he's feeling excited about it. So, All but right. he's packed his bag. So he thinks All it's right. coming soon. Man, that, 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 that's, that's awesome. We're going to keep praying there. And AB, what's going on with your cousin? I'm um, doing okay as of right now. All right. So she's at home, right? Yeah, she's at home. All right. Coach Pierce, you hadn't been on in a while I, that I've seen you, but uh, your, your prayer request a few weeks ago was, you know, I guess your wife is about to have a baby girl. How's that going? Uh, he was on actually, here. I, actually, it's a boy. I've seen it on Instagram. It, it was a, a oh, boy. okay. I thought he had said a girl. I, I... Well, they did a gender reveal and it popped blue. So I'm, I'm guessing oh, it's man. a boy. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Change that. All right. And, uh, and then um, any other prayer requests? We've been praying for Keem's two uncles, uh, Chancey. With the breast cancer, um, I will, will continue to pray for our student athletes. Our guys are in finals right now, so they're done with their class. They just got finals left, and um, you know we just need them to finish strong. So that that's important to us. First thing, uh, yes. Could you uh pray? For, this was on my heart the other day. I, I'm glad I remembered it. To pray for the uh, the student managers, the GAs, uh, and the and just the guys that's trying to just make their way. Uh, I think I've been spoiled and every time I took a job, I took it in April. And then every time I look back, I realize how long guys are in limbo every year trying to find jobs. So I can only imagine how hard it probably is for them right now and what we're living through. Uh, so it's just been on my heart. If you can pray for those, those guys that are trying to find their next destination in this business. No, I appreciate that. Thank you very much.
I was including the seniors in that as well. Oh, that's true. And Akeem, one of his uncles is at home recovering, and um, his other uncle was in the hospital as the last time. He was watching on YouTube. Okay. Uh, that's awesome. Well, Akeem, we've been praying. I've got it written down. We've been praying, so we'll, we'll continue to do that. Uh, anybody else? Coach Tang, just piggying back off of that, I personally – um, I've been praying for everybody just for clarity, opportunities, and uh, guidance. Thanks, Coach White. Coach Tang, I got one. Um, today in Maryland, they just said that their um, school is going to be out for the rest of the, the year. So we have some students who are, are um, that were borderline that are going to be struggling to try to pass to the next grade. If you can just kind of um, say a prayer that you know, they can transition because as of today, there will be no more school for the rest of the year and in the state of Maryland. Okay. Man, we hadn't had any school. Oh, you mean like no online or anything? You're, you're on mute. They're mainly just pushing the, the seniors to try to graduate, but it's gonna be online, but it's very limited on what they're gonna be doing. Anyway, in my district. Okay. Anybody else? Coach Tang, can you um, pray for my family? Um, my father is recovering from a brain stroke. And during this crisis, we can't see him. And he's been away from us since um, mid-January. So just pay, pray for us and all the people who are taking care of him during this time. Okay. Yes, sir. Coach Tang. Also, um, I do have a, a daughter on the way in about two months. It's kind of it's kind of hard times, man, dealing with the virus and just going through, you know, the hospitals. I, I wasn't allowed to go to any doctor's visits, you know, just with this virus going on. It's kind of tough for me as well. So, you know, just pray that everything goes well, you know, when I go to this hospital in the next couple of weeks or so. And also uh, pray, for, pray for the social unrest that's going on down south, man. You know, I'm sure you heard about what, what happened in, in Brunswick uh, two months ago. Yeah, you know, a lot of you know a lot of people is you know enraged about you know the the disparities that have been going on. So I just pray for you know just the, the social unrest going on, and just pray that we get through these these trying times. Yeah. Yeah. Coach Tang, uh, can you pray for my guy Tez? Uh, not a basketball coach, but uh, one of my greatest friends in my life. He's sick right now. He's not doing well. Um, one of the strongest people I know, somebody I call and I talk to every single day. So pray for his help. And, you know, he got his little son living with him. So his little son is looking after him right now. So pray for him if you can. Okay. Anybody else, you know, they say a closed mouth don't get fed. So um I, I believe we serve a, a, a prayer here in God, man. And I'm telling you, I've, I, I, I am, I'm living proof that God answers prayers in every aspect of life. Um, I mean, you know, you, people can chalk it up to what they want, but I'm, I'm just letting you know in my life, he is, he has answered prayers over and over and over again. And so, um, then some of them took, take, take longer. And sometimes the answer is no, but, but, but he hears. And so um, don't, don't, don't hold back if, if you need somebody to pray for you, all right? A anybody else for I pray? All right, bow your hearts with me. Father God, Lord, I'm so thankful for this opportunity. Lord, uh, Lord I just thank thankful for Will getting on here, Lord God. And uh, it's a totally different time right now in Australia. And he's got a lot of things going on. But, but for his heart. To, to care for other people and to, to, to share his experiences, Lord God. Father God, I pray you just give him favor uh, with, with those that he works with and those that, that, uh, that, that employ him, Lord God. And Father God, uh, uh, give him favor with, with his players, Lord God. And Father God, give him creative wisdom, Lord God, as he stretches the game and stretches the minds of those that he comes in contact with, Lord God. Father God, I lift up uh, Tavares and his family to you. Ask that you continue to protect them, keep them safe, Lord God. Father God, bless his players, keep them safe, Lord God. 
Uh, help them to finish the year strong. Lord God, be with his staff. Lord God, Father God, I pray that everything that he puts his hands to do would prosper, Lord God. Father God, Lord, that you would make him, Lord God, the, the, the innovative leader, Lord God, in his field, Lord God, that people would look to him for direction, Lord God, and he would continue to be a, a shining light to those, Lord God, that you've put him over, Lord God. Father God, just, just expand his borders, Lord God, that, that Lord, he would uh, reap from every corner of the the, the world, Lord God, uh, and that, that, that it would be prosperous, Lord God, because he's, he's seeking to benefit lives, Lord God, uh, for a positive way, Lord, and for your kingdom, Lord God. Father God, I just, uh, Lord, just lift up G's dad, Lord God, we are continuing to praise you that he is going to be home, Lord God. Father God, I, I'm just so excited about the expectation, Lord God, bags are packed, Lord God, and Father God, that that plane that flight is going to get cleared. He's going to get to come home, Lord God, for uh, for uh, Chansey, Lord God, and the, the the stage three cancer, Lord God, for the other uh, young lady that we've been praying for, Lord God, with breast cancer, Lord God. We lift them up to you right now, Lord God. Father God, thank you for Alvin's cousin, Lord God, as uh, he's uh, just continuing. She's continuing to get healthy, Lord God, and and Father God, Lord, we're we're, we're praising you, Lord God, for the the, the miracle that you're going to do in in uh, little AJ's life, Lord God, is uh, he's going to be able to express himself verbally, Lord God, as I know that's the desire of Al's heart, Lord God. Father God, we just lift up our student athletes to you, Lord God, and God, particularly right now, we lift up those kids in Maryland, Lord God, whose schools have just been shut down, Lord God. Father God, for those seniors and those kids who are trying to figure out how to complete a school year and how to, how to advance to the next year, Lord God, God, that you would uh, just be with them, Lord God. And uh, Coach Tucker and his district, Lord God, that you would you would just help them be able to to impact those kids' lives, Lord God. Father God, lift up those those managers and GAs, Lord God. We got twenty managers and seven GAs on our staff at Baylor, Lord God. So this this one hits close to home, Lord God. And I just pray, Lord God, that you would just be with those guys, those seniors who are looking for GA positions, those GAs who are looking for jobs, Lord God. Father God, for those who are on tonight, Lord God, that are still looking for employment. For next year, Lord God, God, that you would open those doors, Lord God, Father God, that you would give them favor, Lord God, Father God, Lord, that, that you would allow them, Lord God, to, to shine their light in interviews, Lord God, and make connections that they need, Lord God, Father God, to be able to, to find the jobs that they're looking for and the jobs that they need, Lord God. Father God, I lift up Coach Eddie's father to you. Lord, I ask that you continue to strengthen them, Lord. It's tough right now with, with uh, hospitals, Lord, because you can't go in and see our loved ones, Lord God, and so Lord, I pray that you just be with her dad and be with the family and give them strength, Lord God, and a peace, Lord God, that, that you are in control, Lord God. Father God, I just uh, lift up Coach Joshua's uh, wife, Lord God, as he's expecting a, a baby girl, Lord God, and, and Lord, the, the anxiety, Lord God, with just being a father, Lord God, that, that, that's scary enough, Lord God, but much less to, to, for a baby to be born, Lord, in this situation right now with the the virus, Lord God, Father God, that you would give him peace, Lord God, Father God, give him comfort, help him to have words of comfort and, and peace, Lord God, uh, for, for, for his wife, Lord God, Father God, I lift up Tez, Jareem's friend to you, Lord, I ask that you would just continue to, uh, to, Lord, be with him, Lord God, heal him, Lord God, be with his son, Lord God, Father God, strengthen his body, Lord God, Father God, we continue to pray for Akeem's two uncles, Lord God, continued healing on their lives, Lord God, for Coach Pierce, Lord God, and the baby boy, Lord God, that you would uh, just be with him, Lord God. And, and Father God, I pray, Lord, that uh, you would just this week, Lord, these next few days that we're apart, Lord God, that you would continue to open creative ways for us to help other people, Lord God. Father God, that you would open our hearts and our eyes to see the needs of those around us, Lord God. Your word says to give, and it'll be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, Lord God. Father God, I pray, Lord, you would just give us hearts to give, Lord God, financially, Lord God, of our knowledge, of our time, of our love, of our energy, Lord God. And Lord, your word, Lord God, is true, Lord, that, that it's gonna that it's gonna come back to us and it's gonna be to an overflow and running over more than we could ever ask or imagine, Lord God. And so, Lord, we thank you for that. Father God, I just... Uh, Pray, Lord God, that uh, you continue to bless A.B., Lord God, with his creative thoughts and ideas, Lord God, and his family and protect him. And thank you, Lord God, for the opportunity we have to use basketball as a medium to bring souls to the kingdom. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.
Amen. Amen. Amen. Amen. Amen. Again, thank everybody Amen. for for coming hey. on. Um, I, I'll wait. I'll wait for you, Coach. Okay. Um, the same time Saturday, same time, different link. Okay. And Coach Anisha Curry is going to put something in the chat. So if you don't want to leave, there's going to be some stuff from the night to help you. Yep, yep. Thanks, uh, Coach.